we get started. I asked them a couple of things. I asked them, what's the best thing that has stayed the same about the IETF since the beginning? Um, what's the best thing that has changed? And I asked for some anecdotes uh, to be able to share. So I wanted to tell people a little bit about what I learned in this process. The first thing I learned is that this isn't actually IETF 100. <laughs> it's IETF 99, according to some people who were there from the beginning. This is the front page of the proceedings from what, what is known as IETF 1. Um, and you'll note that the title of the meeting is not, doesn't have the word IETF in it. Um, it was actually the Gateway Algorithms and, and Data Structure Task Force that was meeting. And it didn't become an IETF meeting until uh, halfway through the first day. So, <laughs> and, and, and you'll see, you'll note that actually, if you, if you look closely at this, which you maybe can't see on the slide, it's like this piece of something is taped over that says first IETF. <laughs> So there's a little trickery of labeling going on there. Um, and you know, the lesson we learned from this is that we don't actually know how to count. Um, so <laughs> um, thanks, thanks to Bob Hinden for pointing this out. <laughs> so that was lesson number one. Uh, the next thing that I learned was about friendship. One person told me that uh, the IETF has helped him to make 35-year friends. And that person is pictured on this slide um, and might be here in the audience, Mike St. John's. Uh, another person told me that some of his best friends are people that he has met in the IETF. So I want people to really think about that for a second. If this is your first IETF meeting, anybody this is their first IETF meeting? Oh, yeah, a bunch of people. <laughs> so. You can look to your left and look to your right and think, these are going to be my best friends in 35 years. <laughs> <laughs> and if you've been participating since the 80s and you already have those 35-year friends, you can think to yourself, those friendships have lasted twice as long as the average marriage already. This is, this is what the IETF inspires in people, right? It's amazing. Um, but we must be doing something right uh, if we're bringing people together who uh, you know, remain friends for that long. We use this term community a lot um, in, our, in our daily life. Probably, you probably heard it uh, you know, a couple dozen times today while you were sitting in, in working group meetings talking about uh, consensus decisions and so forth. Um, but we rarely actually stop to consider the sort of fellowship that it, that it implies. Um, and that really came through in, uh, in the the chats that I had with, with folks who've been participating a long time. The last thing that I learned was uh, about the, the sort of spirit that permeates the halls of these meetings. I asked people what was the best thing that hasn't changed, and there was a just remarkable consistency to the answers here. Um, so one person told me that, uh, talked about people working together uh, towards a common goal. Another person said, there's a general feeling of collaboration uh, for the greater good. Essential people doing the right thing. I mean, listen to this stuff, right? Like, think about which other SDO do you go to, and this is what they, they tell you it's about. Um, the commitment of its people to help the internet grow. There's really a sense here that um, people come together not necessarily because they are uh, m you know, motivated by their employer or even personally motivated, but motivated to give something back, to contribute to um, something larger than uh, just their own project, but to, but to come and collaborate uh, to create something larger than themselves. And I think that's as true today as it, prob as, as it seems that it was uh, at IETF1. So I would invite people to uh, raise that glass that you have in your hand uh, and toast to 100 or maybe 99 uh, meetings worth of friendship and collaboration in service of the greater good. Cheers. So now we get to go to the boring part. Uh, <laughs> Here's our agenda for today. We're going to hear a few words from uh, the host of this meeting. 
Then we'll do brief updates on hot topics uh, from me, from uh, the administrative side, Leslie and Portia, and from the NOMCOM, uh, Peter Gee. A uh, quick preview of IETF 101. Then we'll have a recognition of some individuals who uh, are stepping away from the IETF. We'll have the presentation of the Postel Award from ISOC. And then we'll have the technical plenary portion, uh, which is doing a forward look at social, political, and technical perspectives of what the internet's going to look like in the future. And then we'll end with open mics as usual. So first, big thanks to our hosts uh, for this meeting, Cisco. The meetings really uh, wouldn't be the same if we didn't have the support of our sponsors, so we're really thankful for that. Uh, and I will invite uh, Dave Ward to come on up and give us a few words. Thanks, Elizabeth. Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming to uh, the 100th IETF. I'm Dave Ward from Cisco. Many folks have heard of Cisco before, so I'm going to skip the marketing speech. Um, <laughs> if you're not familiar with if you're not familiar with us, our rabid sales team will be after you shortly. Um, but there are a couple of people that I want to call out uh, specifically. One, many of you met as not only did she hand you your cool and awesome circuit Singaporean lion logo t-shirt. She also single-handedly arranged the uh, social event last night at the aquarium that I thought was just simply fantastic at an outstanding venue. And Huang Pham took the day off today, well-deserved, but when you see her around uh, tomorrow or the next day, please say thank you to her. She did all of that work single-handedly. And second, uh, Charles Eckel, who has taken upon himself over the last several years to be the lead of the IETF Hackathon, and he volunteers all of his time for that and organizes the whole thing, and it is uh, the fastest growing part of the IETF community over the last several years. So thanks, Charles. <laughs> third. Uh, shameless self-plug, I'll save all my comments for tomorrow. I speak at uh, the lunch slot tomorrow afternoon, uh, so hope to see you there, and thank you all very much for coming. All right, so um, moving on to IETF slash ISG hot topics. We've covered a bunch of these topics in a written report that was sent uh, to the IETF mailing list last week, so there's a lot more detail there. Just going to cover the highlights um, in the interest of uh, brevity. So we'll talk a little bit about the participant statistics for this meeting. Uh, we have a few requests out to the community that I wanted to highlight for people. Talk a little bit about the side meetings experiment and the code lounge at this meeting. Hopefully people have uh, made use of those. I asked at 2.0, uh, near and dear to my heart, and uh, the ITF website revamp. So the participant statistics, uh, we have 1,011 people on site uh, and 142 first-time attendees, so a participant profile pretty similar to the meeting we had last year at this time in Seoul. Uh, you can see the distribution of folks from uh, different countries, uh, 55 countries represented, pretty typical for, uh, for the meetings these days. The IESG has a couple of requests out to the community right now where we're looking for volunteers and feedback. The first is that this is the year when the IESG selects a uh, one person to serve on the IEOC, the Administrative Committee uh, of the IETF. All you need to do is send name, email, and qualifications uh, to the IESG alias, and those nominations close at the end of this week. So if you know of somebody who you think uh, wants to jump into the administrative side of the IETF, uh, please send us a note. We also have a note out from Spencer uh, seeking people's input about our expression of our expectations for bringing uh, new work into the IETF. Um, the very short summary is that we're hoping to have earlier notice when people want to bring new work in. 
uh, and more attention to the specific work items uh, in, the, in the proposals for new work. There's a somewhat lengthy thread on the IETF mailing list about this, so I encourage you to check it out and send us, uh, send us your thoughts if you have them. There's also uh, a couple of requests out from the IAB to the community. Uh, the IAB is not giving a presentation up here, but I wanted to uh, flag those for people as well. Um, we're looking for volunteers for the ICANN uh, Technical Liaison Group. Again, you can send email to the IAB chair and the executive director uh, if you're interested in serving in this capacity. Um, and the deadline for that is November 29th. And then just yesterday, we also announced that we are seeking candidates to join the ISOC Board of Trustees. Um, there's kind of a staggered nomination or appointment process that goes on for the, that board. So this year we're nominating, we need to select two people. Um, so please send your nominations to uh, the executive director of, of the IAB and those close on January 9th. Side meetings and the code lounge. So we started this experiment back at IETF 99 uh, with side meetings having an online sign up process. And we've adjusted it somewhat at this meeting based on the community feedback from that meeting. Um, so this time we had both a larger room and a smaller room that were bookable in advance. Uh, they both had projectors and uh, the sign up for the meal slots, we transitioned to being uh, only on site because they, they became very contended. Um, so it didn't really work out that well last time. Uh, we also have included now in the sign, on the sign-up page and in the emails a reminder about the IETF meeting rooms policy. There was some concern that the side meeting room sign-up was being used to circumvent the meeting rooms policy, which describes uh, which kinds of organizations can use the space for, for free and, and which need to pay. Um, so folks should keep that in mind when you're signing up for side meetings. But hopefully people have had a chance to, to make use of the side meetings room, and um, we'd, we'd appreciate continued feedback about how, we, how people think the, that experiment is going. We also had the code lounge for the first time at this IETF. So this was a portion of the IETF lounge that um, was set aside for working group chairs to be able to reserve time for coding sessions uh, amongst their participants. Uh, and again, definitely looking for feedback. I don't, we didn't get a lot of signups ahead of time, um, but would be interested to know how people ended up using the space. Uh, I asked at 2.0. So this has been a recurring topic uh, that you've seen presented in plenary and in the, in the written reports, uh, and some of you are participating on the mailing list already. Uh, a discussion that started towards the end of last year about potentially refactoring our administrative arrangements uh, that we use to support the IETF. Uh, those arrangements are uh, more than 10 years old, so it seemed like a good time to, to revisit there's a design team that was set up a couple of months ago to start exploring some options for this, and they have a, a very nice document that I encourage people to go take a look at. Uh, they put a lot of effort into fleshing out uh, the problem statement, what the requirements are for the future, and uh, exploring some three, three specific options. We had a boff yesterday on this topic uh, where the community uh, gave further consideration to the work of the design team and the result of that was that we narrowed the list of these structural options that uh, are discussed in the design team document um, down from, from three, to, three to a range between the other two, uh, and essentially identified some areas that need to be further fleshed out, both uh, from the IETF side, but also in, in partnership with ISOC uh, to try and figure out what the right next step is here. So I encourage people to join the mailing list. Um, this is not something that happens you know, every, every year in the IETF. It's, uh, it's a fairly infrequent thing, um, but should have uh, hopefully some positive impact on our administrative structure uh, once, we, once we get it done. We've also had ongoing the IETF website revamp, uh, again, a, a project that was started uh, some time ago to uh, redo the uh, look and feel and some of the functionality of the IETF website. Um, there's a scope of work that was uh, written down a couple of years ago that you can go check out to try and understand the, the parameters of the project. The phase that we're in now is really a fine-tuning phase, uh, so we've had a, many rounds of feedback um, from focus groups and then from the broader community over the last um, several months. We're hoping to move it to production after IETF 100. Uh, so you can take a look at it. It's at beta.ietf.org. 
and um, continue to provide feedback. Some folks are providing feedback on um, the IETF mailing list, which is great. You can also file issues in GitHub um, or send email uh, directly to webmaster at IETF.org. Uh, Greg Wood, where's Greg Wood? He also has, um, who's, who's been managing this project, has a, a table at near IETF registration where you can go provide feedback as well. Uh, another couple of announcements from the IAB uh, that the IAB wanted me to relay. Uh, they've done two appointments recently. Um, the first one is for the independent series editor. So um, after many years of service, Neville Brownlee uh, will be uh, ending his term as ISE. And the IAB has appointed Adrian Farrell uh, to take on the helm in February. We also uh, recently reappointed Heather Flanagan as the RFC series editor. Um, that's one of the uh, important duties of, of the IAB. Uh, so thank you uh, both to Neville and uh, Adrian and Heather for your willingness to, to continue. So there's a bunch more in the written report online, as I said, a um, little bit more about experiments, a uh, note about appeals. There have been none since uh, ITF 99. Uh, status update on uh, the project to help remediate some of the DMARC issues on the ITF mailing lists, um, and lots of other reports from, uh, from the other bodies. You can also always check out the ITF blog where we try to uh, keep uh, fresh content coming all the time about what's going on in the ITF. And with that, I would invite uh, Leslie and Portia up for administrative hot topics. do this yeah I'm not likely to figure this out anytime soon thank you <laughs> I don't generally play the slideshow on my own computer so great thanks uh, so my name is Leslie Daigle and I'm the IOC chair and as a first oh dear thank you this is going to be fun. Thank you. I'll get there. Would you like me to come down and watch uh, <coughs> what you're doing? <laughs> all right. And I'll be checking all your computing as we go along through the evening. All right. So my name is still Leslie Daigle. I'm chair of the IOC. And as a first hot topic from, uh, from our end, uh, it is my pleasure to um, uh, to introduce you to. Um, you all know that we've hired an interim uh, IAD since you all read your email, right? Uh, so it is my pleasure to introduce you Portia Wen Stanley, who is our interim IAD, and she will take the first part of our presentation. Portia. Um, thank you, thank you, and uh, thank you for the champagne to calm my nerves. <laughs> And um, so it is my pleasure to have the opportunity to thank the sponsors of ITF 100 for assist assisting us with your much appreciated gifts. Our global host, Cisco, thank you very much. Um, uh, we also have. Um, host for um, our gold sponsors, silver and bronze, gold, China Internet Network uh, Information Center, our silver ICANN, bronze sponsor Infocom Media Development Authority, and we have connectivity sponsors, um, Starhub, ViewQuest, NTT Communications, and uh, Merit Lindo Broadband Company. Um, our Thursday break sponsor is Huawei. 
And um, our, we also like to um, have, thank our um, volunteers for our coach, Brent, and uh, they have worked diligently um, during this meeting um, to enhance the IEF, IETF data tracker and developing tools for the community. Thank you again to uh, Cisco for sponsoring the hackathon and um, support also provided by Cisco. And we also would like to acknowledge our volunteers for um, in our NOC team and our line speed is our contractor for the network, which is led by Rick Alfred. And um, the NOC is also led by Jim Martin and um, a, a host of volunteers that are listed there on the slide. And we also have Meet Echo, who is a contractor responsible for seamlessly connecting remote participants in the meeting, to the meeting. Thank you to all of them, thank you. And then last but not least, I'd like to uh, continue and um, encourage you to attend Thursday Tech Talk with Dave Ward from Cisco. Thank you. Leslie. Great. Thank you. So um, a few uh, IOC updates, um, particularly the much long-awaited pr uh, privacy policy update, and the second one, the document authentication policy. If that doesn't sound familiar, it may have been, you may have heard it referred to as a subpoena policy. They are updated since our last meeting and available online. Uh, we do have a detailed report, as Alyssa noted, and uh, you can find that um, on the IOC website. Um, I did want to highlight one particular area. Um, I mentioned, I think, at the last plenary and have outlined in the, in the report that um, we're looking at attendance, uh, we're looking at meeting revenues and sponsorship support. Um, and while we had about 10 years where we, we were able to accurately um, predict meeting attendance and thus uh, build our budgets accordingly, the last couple years have thrown us something of a curveball. Um, and as you can see from the Prague meeting financial summary, um, we have not been so successful in, um, we've, under, we've overestimated how many people we would have at a given meeting. And so um, overall between that um, and our uh, sponsorship revenues, um, we are looking at, we are, we are under budget on revenues. Um, so if we look at the Singapore meeting so far, and these numbers are slightly different than the ones that Alyssa presented, uh, in part because they were collected, uh, I think a couple of days earlier, um, but still, um, even at the slightly north of 1,000 number that Alyssa had on, on her slide, we're a couple hundred attendees short of where we thought we were going to be for this meeting. Um, we do have quite a number of registered remote participants, um, and um, a number of people had visas, had visas issued so that they come, could come and participate in this meeting. So the Singapore meeting will have more data when the dust settles, of course. Um, but I think we're beginning to see something of a, I won't say concerning trend, but from a financial perspective, it's a concerning trend. Um, so for the budget perspective, um, we have put together a budget which uh, will be part of the ISOC budget that is review reviewed this weekend at the ISOC board meeting. Uh, so that's why all of these are proposed items. Uh, for the 2018 proposed expense budget, uh, we've kept expenses level at seven, around seven million. Um, we have budgeted less, re we've predicted less revenue, we've budgeted for less revenue by a million dollars, um, reflecting the impact that we've seen in the decline of um, participation on site and, attend and sponsorships. Um, we have not, for the 2018 budget, put in any expectation of a meeting fee increase. Uh, however, uh, we have proposed a $900,000 increase in, in direct Internet Society support uh, for 2018 and predicted, projected a uh, registration fee increase of a fairly significant 10% for 2019 um, and possibly 33% in 2020 and, and onwards. 
Um, all of these things are uh, our current projection of the future. Uh, our crystal ball is uh, well informed by data, but otherwise no better than anybody else's crystal ball. Um, so between the IASA 2.0 work, where you know we're looking at possible structural changes, uh, and the fact that you know we know that we need to have a look at the overall financial model of the IETF, where do we lean to get financial support for the work of the IETF, um, and and how can we you know find more of it and or better support ourselves? All of these things may change. So. I just wanted to make sure that everybody is clear on the sort of the trend lines that we've got um, and to expect, sadly, more discussions about this um, in the coming years. There is no specific plan in hand today. Uh, and as I said, there is not currently a meeting registration fee increase planned for 2018. Um, but we have to figure out, <laughs> we can't continually live on, on a negative um, incline and uh, we'll have to have some hard discussions in the coming months. So, uh, not to end on a downer, but thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, so next we have uh, Peter Yi, NomCom Update. This is your 2017-2018 NOMCOM, and importantly, a couple of email addresses there that allow you to reach us, uh, either the chair or position or the whole of the NOMCOM uh, on that second alias, and this is, this is gonna come into uh, play when we get to the third slide. These are the positions we're working to fill right now. Uh, as you can see, one position at the IAOC. We have six members of the IAB who are up and then various members of the IESG. The stars next to the names indicate people who are not um, re-upping their positions. Now, at this meeting, um, we are entering phase two of our efforts. Up to this date, you know, we've been looking for nominees, we've been soliciting feedback. We continue to solicit feedback. We are also doing our nomin uh, nominee interviews uh, here at the meeting. Uh, the deadline for feedback is next Friday, the 24th, um, and of course, for those of you who have holidays next week, uh, maybe this week would be a really good time to get that feedback in. If you wish to send feedback on individual candidates, you can do so uh, through the NOMCOM website, there down at the bottom. You can send email if you want to just cover, you know, uh, the general topic of an of a area that you want to send uh, input on. And if you wanted to send anonymous input, you can send that to the chair alias, and I can um, enter that either anonymously into the data tracker or share it um, without attribution to the rest of the NOMCOM. So um, our plans then are to uh, continue working through the nomination, uh, nominee interviews, and we hope to have um, decisions taken by January and then submitted to the um, confirming bodies. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, and thank you to the NOMCOM for all your hard work. So um, just a quick note about our next meeting, uh, IETF 101, which will be in London. Uh, co-hosted by Google and ICANN, um, so everybody uh, hopefully is planning to attend that one, and um, big thanks to Google and ICANN for, um, for agreeing to host. Uh, typically we have a little preview of the next meeting, but they both thought we could better use the time charging forth on the plenary agenda, so thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> And now's the time when we get to recognize a few, uh, a few special folks here. So I will ask Leslie to come on back up to do the first recognition.
This time I brought paper. Um, so as many of you know, Ray Pelletier became our first IETF Administrative Director in 2005. And double bonus points for those of you who are reading your email, um, you know that he retired from that position on October 31st. So in 2005, the IETF had met only for about 60 odd meetings, and we know they're pretty odd meetings. Um, it was supported by the contributed efforts of a few organizations, integrated administrative machine. And so there's just one more thing to say, and that's thank you, Ray Pelletier. And I usually stood up here, usually to make thank yous, and um, will I change anything? I do want to make some thank yous. I did prepare about 15 slides, <clears throat> <laughs> but it was suggested that perhaps I shouldn't do that. Um, I do want to say that, you know, the IED position is just one part of the IETF support organization. I've been here 12 and a half years, and I've worked with a, numerous people on the IOC all the IETF, IOC com uh, committees that we have, all the volunteers, like in the NOC and uh, the Code Sprint, all the contractors, the Secretariat, the RFC editor, uh, Verilan, Line Speed, uh, all those, and Meet Echo, my Italian friends. All the sponsors, the global hosts, and all the other hosts and connectivity sponsors, ISOC, has contributed close to $20 million over this period of time in support, as well as providing some accounting, legal, and financial support. Thank you very much. And of course, the community. I had a lot of guidance and support. <laughs> um, and <laughs> and uh, I appreciate it. I learned an awful lot by doing this. So any success that we've had, frankly, is a, is a success of the entire team not just the IAD. I just happen to be in the middle of doing a lot of things and often refer to myself as a single point of failure or SPOF. And indeed, occasionally it was. My, my motivation in accepting this job was frankly to support the very important contributions that the IETF, IETF was making uh, to the world. It meant a lot to me to be doing something that meant a lot to, to others, and I'm very happy to have contributed in a small way to the work that you had done. And over these 12 years, there's been 4,000 plus RFCs that were developed. I didn't write one of them, <laughs> nor could I. I couldn't possibly do your job. And I have a tremendous respect and admiration for all of you. Um, so it's really been an honor and a privilege to have supported your efforts in the, in, the small, in the small way that I could possibly do that. So in every meeting, I, there's, there's, I always get one question, and it's not about the cookies. And the question is, somebody will come up to me after 16 or 17 weeks in which we've been apart, and they'll shake my hand and look over my shoulder and say, where's Ro? <laughs> and so for every meeting, my wife has been with me, my brilliant, smart, talented rock star, beautiful Italian wife 
has been with me, and she's here tonight, and I thank you very much. Where are you? Where's Ro? Ro is back here, back there. Thank you. If I started naming names, I couldn't leave. So I'm, I, will, I will defer that and send out notes uh, individually. But it really has been a privilege to have served you in the small capacity that I could. Thank you all very much. Cheers. Is it my turn? It's your turn. So I get to say thank you. <laughs> For, for 20 years, we've had one council for the IETF and then for the IETF Trust. And George Contreras has been that council. And he's been the person to who, who I have turned to and to whom we have turned to throughout these many years having to do with intellectual property and subpoenas and documents and affidavits, et cetera. It's just trademarks. It's a tremendous amount of work. George, where are you? You're supposed to be here. We told you to be here. Are you here? Come on up here. Come on up here. Of course, there's a plaque. Right? Of Absolutely. course, on the plaque, yeah. George Contreras, IETF counsel and IPR guru, <laughs> 1998 to 2017. Awesome. We need pictures. Okay, okay, okay. picture. Back here. Yeah, okay. Thanks, Mike. Okay, can I make my speech now? Yes, you can. All right. <clears throat> All right, so, uh, so hey, thank, thanks very much. So, 20 years is a really long time and for any lawyer to represent a client that doesn't actually exist. It's an amazing, an amazing accomplishment. So, you know, to prove it, to prove that this happened, I actually dug out my t-shirt from my first IETF meeting, which is IETF 46 in Washington, DC, um, which is where I spend most of my practice. And, uh, you know, my mom was appalled that for this auspicious occasion where I get this plaque, I'm wearing a 19-year-old t-shirt. Um, but it still actually looks pretty good. Um, I don't look that good in it, but the t-shirt's good. So I started representing IETF um, under the administration of Fred Baker, um, and then served through the administrations of Harold Alvestrand, Brian Carpenter, Russ Housley, Yari Arco, and now briefly, Alyssa Cooper. And you know, by DC standards, that's pretty good. That's a pretty good record. Um, so when, I, when Harold became IETF chair, uh, he, he came to Washington uh, to meet, and our offices were at the, uh, the Willard Office Building, Pennsylvania Avenue, two blocks from the White House, and we sat up on this roof terrace um, and had this conversation. And he asked me in that you know, Norwegian, charming Norwegian accent, he asked, like, what do you do? Um, and I don't know. I, I didn't know how to, I still don't know what the answer is, but uh, you know, we, we've done it for a long time. So thanks a lot, um, Ray you know, has been a, uh, a stalwart and a great supporter over all these years. Um, he's also a lawyer, believe it or not, that he, he will not admit it. Uh, I have it on good authority that he's a lawyer too. Um, but he's, uh, he's been great, um, as have so many other people at IETF. Um, and I do want to thank especially Scott Bradner, who I know is not here in Singapore, um, but he really is the one who uh, is behind the spirit of the IPR policies and many of the policies that we have at IETF. Um, IETF is different than every other standards organization in the world um, that I know of, and in this case, I think the difference actually makes it better. So uh, thanks to everyone. Um, I really appreciate it. It's been a great run. Great. Uh, next is Heather and Ted. If you could come on up. Just Heather. Heather and not Ted. <laughs> we should actually say Heather and Neville. Where is Neville? Neville, come here. <laughs> you didn't think you were going to get away that easily, did you? <laughs> 
He's going to kill me later. <laughs> but very nicely. He's very polite about it. <laughs> okay. So Neville was appointed as independent submissions editor in 2010. Now, that was in the midst of a fairly tumultuous time for the RFC editor in particular, because that's when we were transitioning from ISI to AMS. We uh, worked through a couple of RFC series editor, transitional acting and current. Um, and we spent some quality time figuring out what we needed to do next. And uh, as with many of the positions in and around the IETF, Neville's appointment as ISE was as much him stepping up to the plate as it was him not running fast enough when um, Brian Carpenter and others approached him for uh, applying for the position. So Neville is a uh, editor of many talents. Um, he plays a piano, unless there's a sign on it saying don't touch it. Um, he practices yoga. Uh, and the skills he brings as a professor and a grandfather, uh, no doubt, served him quite well in dealing with authors. <laughs> um, and let's not forget the phrase, you know, if, if I need help, I'll ask for it. Uh, a phrase he used quite often with the IESG. Um, enough that they gave him a t-shirt, which I believe he was wearing earlier today. Um, so I'd like to offer thanks on behalf of the RFC editor team uh, and many others uh, for all the sanity that you brought to the role and all the help you've been to us over the last seven years. And I hope you remember the fun times, because there were some fun times. And the fun times sort of come in the form of this book of all the April 1st RFCs that have been published since uh, 1978. So this book, um, there's a lot of, of colorful sticky notes in it. And uh, those, those sticky notes are actually, well, they were blank pages. They're now filled with well wishes to you. So I, I hope you enjoy reminding yourself of the RFCs and uh, enjoying the well wishes from the community. So. I feel a bit overwhelmed by all this, and it's very unexpected. But at the time I started, that was the point where um, Bob Braden was in the process of stepping down. So I, I had two days at ISI when I found out all about how the IF, uh, RFCs were produced. And then Bob Braden gave me a list of, of um, what he had as independent stream contributions and said, here it is, off you go. And so over, over the years, it's been a long learning experience from there. And as Heather said, we, it took us a couple of years to work out exactly what we wanted in an RFC uh, editor, series editor. And then we went out and found Heather, which is wonderful. And in the years since then, uh, I've had a steady flow of um, ind independent submissions. I've published what I think are a fairly long list of worthwhile RFCs. And I've had a lot of fun looking at the April 1st RFCs, which are very special because, of course, they don't exist. There are no internet drafts for them beforehand. And along the way, I've certainly met a lot of people whom I would not otherwise have met, and I really enjoyed working with them and helping them. So thank you very much for all this. Okay, next we have the Jonathan B. Postel Award, Kathy. everyone. It seems very special that we're, uh, we are awarding this year's John Pastel Award on the 100th meeting of the IETF. Um, 
We know that uh, John was the first of many, had the first of many jobs at the IETF. And um, it's always quite inspiring when you think about what one man accomplished uh, in too short a time. On our 25th anniversary of ISOC, it's also quite warming to remember and know that he was the first member of the Internet Society. So uh, we think of him today as we um, honor yet another one of our outstanding colleagues. So the Jonathan B. Postel Award was established by the Internet Society to honor individuals or organizations that, like John, have made outstanding contributions in service uh, to the data communications community. The award is focused on sustained and substantial technical contributions, service to the community, and leadership. The, award, the awardees of the uh, Postel Award uh, are here, and amongst them, you know, are some of our most distinguished colleagues. They and a committee of this group uh, are the, um, the selection committee uh, for the next year's award. So this is 19. It is my great pleasure to announce this year the award of the 2017 Jonathan B. Costello Award, Casey Clapp. So, Casey, you're not going to get the award just now. Uh, my name is Olaf Kolkman, Chief Internet Technology Officer from the Internet Society. Let me share with you why I'm so happy and proud that I am allowed to hand over the award to KC. KC leads KEDA, not KAIDA. I was just explained that that is the wrong way to pronounce it. The Center of Applied Internet Data Analysis. KEDA is a unique place. It's one of these places where scientific rigor applied measurements, open data, and the internet come together. On the science, since its inception in 1997, the group has published over 350 papers, in the majority of them in peer-reviewed journals. And they've done so on a broad set of, top, uh, of, of, uh, of, uh, of topics. Kaida also makes it data available which means that over 1,100 papers have been published based on that data. That's an enormous contribution to the body of public knowledge. CADA has also become the go-to place to get insight on the large-scale topology of the Internet, the place to get neutral data that will inform both engineers and policymakers in their work, and if you want to have a map of the internet topology, know more about spoofed addresses, IP reputations, large-scale outages, et cetera, et cetera, you go to CADA. It is that body of work that forms the basis for evidence-based work, both in the technical and the policy domain. And that's not all. KC has always promoted sharing of data. The core of scientific work is that data, that experiments are reproducible, and when data is hard to gather, which on the internet it is, it is very important to make it available to the rest of the community in the interest of science. And Casey has always made that a commitment, uh, that commitment a cornerstone of her work. Finally, Casey is one of these leaders with a vision that gets things funded and done, sometimes facing bureaucratic challenges and almost always in environments where those that are being measured would prefer not to. Thank you, Casey.
Kathy said this morning I should speak for three to five minutes. And my husband said, wow, you're going to have to come up with 30 minutes of material for that. <laughs> but I promised I was going to talk slow. <laughs> er. <laughs> Too late, right? Um, this has, I think it's fair to say, been the most surprising positive. Huh? Oh, me? Oh, that's not me. <laughs> yes, I do. Can I? Cancel, and can I just... That should have been the first thing I did. <laughs> I was like, too many of me. One is too many. <laughs> okay. Total honor. Surprising honor. Um, total shock. I haven't been to one of these meetings in 15 years. Many of you are coming up to me and saying, what are you doing here, Casey? <laughs> it's been great to see you all. And some of you I haven't yet connected with. And please find me before I leave. I'm here till Saturday. So you know my email address. It's Casey at something. Um, and the other uh, reason is that I tend to focus more on what we haven't accomplished yet rather than what we have. I had no idea we had that many papers published. Olaf, that's really cool. I don't do that measurement uh, enough. Um, but also because I, my initial reaction was, what? I, those are the guys inventing the thing that we're studying. All we're doing is trying to measure it, although it is hard. <laughs> Um, but I couldn't do it without you all always helping me, helping us, CATA folks, uh, validate our inferences. The biggest problem in uh, internet science, second biggest reproducibility. Um, uh, and I also couldn't do what I do without my family, my husband and son who are over there, uh, and their first IETF, <laughs> newcomers to the IETF. Uh, and again, if you've spent time with me, you can know what a challenge it must be to be married to me. At dinner, my husband will say something, and I'll say, how is that measured? <laughs> it's totally irritating, <laughs> but he manages. Uh, so I want to just say one quote uh, that follows on from the Postel quote we all know, which is kind of a biblical tenet, if you ask me, be liberal in what you, uh, or liberal in what you accept, conservative in what you send. If you go to RFC 1122, I, go, I like to go to the source material, is what researchers do. And right after that quote, which is quoted from an earlier RFC, uh, Bob Braden, then the editor of this document, the host requirements document, says the following. Software should be written to deal with every conceivable error, no matter how unlikely. Sooner or later, a packet will come in with that particular combination of errors and attributes. And unless the software is prepared, chaos can ensue. <laughs> 1989. <laughs> In general, it is best to assume that the network is filled with malevolent entities that will send in packets designed to have the worst possible effect. No IoT back then, 1989. <laughs> Next, he gets a little more optimistic. This assumption will lead to suitable protective design. <laughs> <laughs> Although the most serious problem in the internet have been serious problems have been caused by unenvisaged mechanisms triggered by low probability events. Mere human malice would never have taken so obvious a course. Exclamation point. Uh, 30 years ago, that is. And that was 20 years after ARPANET, DARPANET, 1969. So we are 50 years into this, people. We are old. We are like the bellheads that we used to call the old people 30 years ago. Uh, and then we were, they were just building a network. Uh, they didn't, well, in 1989, even in 1989, they knew the promise and perils of the, of the internet. And of course, even John knew we have to do something to prevent the chaos. There needs to be a Bureau of Internet Numbers, and, and he became it. Today, the promise and the peril are much stronger and much harder to measure. They go up many layers. Um, and there's going to be a lot more needed in the next 20 years than in the last 20. So this award really did make me take stock of where we've been, although I didn't count papers. Uh, and we are going into writing our program plan, CATA's program plan, for uh, the next four years. And this came at a really uh, profound time for us. So just to give you an idea, one of the things we're going to try to do in the next four years, the fantastic group. There was a slide of the, all the people at CATA that are doing the real work, so I feel bad taking credit for all the real work happens back there, as you know, if you lead a group. Um, one of the things we're going to do in the next few years is tie together a bunch of the measurement projects that exist at CATA that are a little bit siloed and don't have a unified interface and try to create a bit of a, uh, and make it easier to get access to some of this data that I know people use, but I know could be easier to use. 
So in that line, I'm going to do one plug for a CADA project and then get off the stage and watch people on a panel talk about how to measure the future of the internet, maybe, um, which is quite a few things about the internet you can measure from anywhere, like IPv6, whether something is supporting IPv6, or DNSSEC. Um, and you might get really depressed if you do try to measure it, which I have in the past. Um, however, there's one thing, and it's also a 35-year-old problem on the internet, called uh, Ingress filtering, or BCP38, uh, that you, it's very hard to measure from anywhere on the internet, so it's very hard for researchers to do it. The only real way to measure it, now this is not quite true, but I'll oversimplify for right now, uh, is to get inside each network and measure it. So what is it? It's uh, preventing spoofed packets, who apparently can put any malicious thing they want in the packet. It's preventing packets from fake source, with fake source addresses from leaving the network, from leaving your network. Classic incentive misaligned a uh, configuration that you would have to put into your routers in order to protect the rest of the internet from somebody in your network sending traffic that may be attack traffic that has a fake address and you can't then easily trace back to the source of the problem. So a group, group of CADA, group of folks at CADA have built a tool called spoofer.cada.org and I guarantee you, well, I, pro I propose, there is nothing else you can do in 60 seconds that will have an impact on internet security like this will. You can download this tool, install it on your laptop, and what you do is you, it goes around, you go around the world, it's really good for people who travel a lot to meetings and go to strange networks. You go around the world and it will test that, whether that network can spoof by sending various types of spoof packets back to uh, trusted servers at CADA, and then we analyze which networks can and can spoof, and you can see all of the data, you can opt out to having it be published uh, unanonymized, and then we share aggregated versions of this data for, with, we share aggregated versions publicly, we share an unanonymized versions with remediation authorities to help clean up this 35-year-old problem. So we're still going with the protocol where you can put a fake source address in the packet, guys. <laughs> I'm a little worried about that, but as long as we still have that be the protocol, we better get better measurement of it. So that's one of the small pieces that we're working on, and I will end on that note and give you a business card to deploy it if you want. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you so much. So next up, we have the technical plenary. I would invite uh, Brian Trammell and our plenary panelists to come up to the stage. And while we do that, um, Casey's remarks actually reminded me of, of one other tidbit from my um, collection of anecdotes from folks who were been participating in the IETF for a long time. Um, one of them explained that in the early days of the IETF, it felt so liberating to just have no process. It was like we just made it up as we went along, and as compared to like this this ISO stuff that people had been doing, it just it felt like like so liberating. And he ended the paragraph with, "We may have become our parents after 30 years." <laughs> it's like both on the technical side and the process side. Did you have? Okay. Uh, hi, good evening. I'm Brian Trammell. Uh, as you may have noticed, this is IETF 100 um, from the Champagne and whatnot. Um, we've done some looking back, uh, and often at the tech plenary, we look forward. We look at things that are happening right now or happening, you know, in the coming year or two years, things that we think are, are, are um, short upcoming developments. Um, we're going to do something a little different tonight. Um, we uh, have, uh, uh, we're going to look a little bit further ahead at this milestone. So we've had 100 meetings. Um, as we've heard in a couple of, of speeches before, the internet has changed a lot during that time. In, in some ways, it's changed a little less. Um, a lot of that is in part to what we do here. Um, so the question that we want to ask is, what will the internet look like at the time of IETF 200? Um, so we've asked a panel of, of people, some, some of whom uh, many of us know, um, to talk with us tonight about this question from a variety of different perspectives. So we have, um, first, Jun Murai. Uh, he's the founder of the WIDE Project, professor at KU University, um, with a focus on global computer networking 
and communication. He's known as the father of Japan's internet or the internet samurai. We have um, Henning Schulzrenne, chair of the Department of Computer Science at Columbia University in New York, and Monique Moreau, uh, president and co-founder of the Human Internet, Humanized Internet, sorry, um, a nonprofit organization focused on providing digital identity for those um, uh, individuals most underserved. So first, I'd like to invite June to come up to the stage. Okay. Opening remarks. Uh, should, mm -hmm. Yeah. Here? Yeah. And the slides, the slides will. I can be, use this one. Oh, yes. Uh, yes, I know how to use a Mac. Um, Okay, good evening, everybody. Uh, this is Jim Rai, and uh, uh, from from Wide Project K University, and uh, I, I I put my title Internet Civilization, but uh, you know it means that uh, any of the space of the life on this planet, uh, then you know uh, it's a it's a no 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 place without the internet, no activities, no life. Uh, no industry uh, without the internet. Uh, when we think about the 200 ITF time, right? And uh, so uh, we already uh, understand that uh, kind of a situation already. So uh, therefore, I, I called it uh, internet civilization. But anyway, I myself uh, have been you know, participating on the ITF a uh, long time ago, <coughs> like a field growth time. And uh, then uh, I've been uh, participating on uh, developing the technology. And uh, then uh, uh, when we are working as a kind part of the university activities and uh, then uh, uh, around the, uh, connecting with the uh, uh, universities around the world, and uh, that was the academic network. And uh, then you know, that we didn't uh, understand the uh, national boundary at all. So uh, that's how we developed the internet. And uh, therefore, the, it's a very uh, interesting space so we have been, you know, developing the internet, bridging the uh, the all the uh, all the space beyond the border of uh, nations. And uh, then we didn't even think about the nations' border. And uh, probably that's one of the reasons I was uh, sitting in here and uh, discussing with uh, many of the people because I'm the other side of the Pacific Ocean, and uh, then uh, many people sitting in the, uh, no, this place is there, uh, my side, I'm sorry, <laughs> uh, when I first participated in the United States, you know, that's the time. But anyway, so after that, then, uh, you know, internet is uh, uh, not only by uh, used by the university people, but also by the many of the other industries, therefore, the, any kind of uh, verticals uh, connected by internet, uh, which is uh, changing the world drastically. And that so uh, then, you know, when the data is uh, uh, shared uh, on the uh, internet, then, you know, that's a lot of uh, uh, beyond the data, beyond the silo, beyond the verticals, uh, bridging the impacts is uh, happening. And uh, therefore, the, that's the impact of the internet and the internet state uh, in the single internet around the world, in the global space. Uh, that kind of uh, concept and uh, uh, principle is uh, be very much, uh, you know, uh, creating the any possibility on the human being that the collaborations are beyond the borders. And uh, then, you know, also a service platform uh, is uh, created on the top of it, and uh, probably the uh, the data not necessarily be IoT, but uh, you know, the digital data is uh, uh, transmitted and exchanged over the internet, and uh, then the service platform, like, uh, you know, people can, uh, utilizing their creativity and the wisdom to, uh, uh, on the platform of the service platform, like, uh, you know, web architecture and other things. Uh, therefore, there are a lot of uh, new things happening, and uh, then ideas can be implemented on the common platform, that's uh, standardization of the technology. But, uh, uh, when we think about the uh, standardization of the technology, then the ITF is uh, concentrating on a, in the bottom of the IT, uh, internet part only. And uh, then, you know, the, as we all know, that the uh, web architecture, uh, HTML5 stand, HTML standard, 
is uh, split into the W3C. So as the many of the service platform application area is uh, creating the different type of the standards. So that's uh, one of the concern we are now facing at, that the internet committee in here is uh, thinking about the internet layer and the, then they know, uh, but uh, we, uh, long time ago we worked uh, we worked on uh, you know many of the application area as well, and uh, then uh, sometimes splitting into the various uh, technologies. So that's my concern is uh, you know again the splitting into the various pieces of the areas of the segment, and uh, then you know they started to create the new type of, the, of a death standard on the digital and the communication way. For example, I'm working on recently on a, you know medical device standard which is uh, basically worked in the ISO and the IEC. And uh, I looked at the other specs, and uh, then uh, there's no specification about the network. There's no specification about the timestamp even, and uh, on the data. Therefore, there no, no specification about how to connect the medical devices in uh, your hospital's operation uh, system, so, uh, you know, operation room. So, uh, uh, you know, I'm started to worry about the, those segments of the industry started to utilize the digital communication thing, but not, uh, not necessarily be working with us, meaning that, uh, you know, uh, learning from us. So, but that's uh, probably one of the concerns that uh, we should, we might be, uh, you know, thinking for the future that the, it's a very important that the necessary uh, collaboration should be established, and uh, then uh, so that uh, you know beyond the side wall, silo wall, uh, and uh, uh, we can we can de-silo everything. So that's that's one message. And uh, then you know this slide is uh, you know I recently used uh, for the many of the cases, and then you know when the society is uh, viewing the internet space, then you know they call it uh, whatever. The thing, the internet. I mean, ITF definition of the internet is uh, pretty specific, but uh, not for the everybody. But uh, everybody is now utilizing the internet. Therefore, the you know what we are working on is not sometimes uh, recognized in the global society who are really depend on the internet. Therefore, the uh, as I said, the uh, different type of a technical standard is uh, you know uh, going on, which is uh, the part of what I worry about. So uh, the you know, be, beyond the surface of the ocean, uh, beneath the surface of the ocean, then there is a lot of uh, work going on, but the people not always noticing uh, the, our, our work. And then, you know, a lot of services, applications, and, uh, you know, the businesses on top of it is uh, always uh, their concern, but it's uh, really important that uh, uh, they should recognize the work uh, on the beneath of the surface of the ocean. So. Uh, that's, uh, you know, the definition of the internet today. So that's uh, basically the thing. Then the one more thing is that the, the uh, this is, since this is age then the last century, then the you know, US uh, internet population was very large, and the, then the age was small, and the, then they you know, the, this is a 2015, 16, 17. And the, therefore, now we are an entire world, and then you know, beyond the, finally, beyond the 50% uh, of the population is uh, utilizing, accessing the internet. And the, then the, therefore, the next ITF, I mean, next ITF uh, 200, then, uh, you know, it's uh, certainly the, uh, almost 100% uh, of the population is uh, utilizing the internet. And, uh, then, uh, you know, uh, what is the impact of the technology standard, right? So that's, base, that's another thing. So let me, well, this is a, a digital fabrication things and the, the changing the manufacturing and the fabrication factory and, the, you know, that kind of industry very much. But it's also on the internet. And the, then the, we are working on, a, you know, digital scan and the sending the digital data beyond the border of anything, and then they're reproducing by a 3D printer, like, a, like a fab digital fabrication things. Then, then we don't need the transportation system, uh, delivery system, and the, uh, the, the tax, and the tax at the border of the nation. It's, a, it's gonna be a very difficult. But anyway, so that kind of thing's happening everywhere. So internet, 
uh, is for everyone is a kind of a motto uh, of the ISOC in the uh, uh, mid 90s, I believe. Uh, we worked on the uh, phrase, but uh, then I know uh, th this committee is uh, uh, working for everyone now. And uh, by the IoT devices and everything, then everything and uh, everyone. But uh, we are, uh, so the technology has to be uh, concerned about the new technology coming with the new devices, new area of industries. Uh, I really need think that the internet community should uh, consider about the each of the areas. So uh, no area of life without the internet can be uh, <coughs> considered in the next uh, 30 years of the internet uh, history. So uh, uh, the technical challenges is always interesting and then uh, we've been working on that. And uh, then, you know, so uh, this planet is a daytime planet, but uh, one of my friends, uh, two times uh, astronauts observing the Earth from the uh, space shuttle, uh, Mr. Mori-san. And uh, then, you know, he was talking about the daytime planet and the nighttime planet. Nighttime planet is a light. Therefore, it's a technology is the environment. This is the environment, this is the environment. So uh, now technology is the environment. We are all working for the environment for this planet. And uh, so that was a very encouraging message I received from him. So the uh, last message is, uh, you know, some of my friends, uh, it's too late to say in the ITF 100, but I still want to say don't politicize the internet. Thank you very much. I have tried to do my homework assignment. I'm pretty sure I've pretty miserably failed, uh, but I'll have the advantage that in 30 years or so, I'm hoping that I won't be here at the meeting if I'm allowed. <laughs> uh, so let me do kind of four kinds of predictions I, that illustrate, I think, different perspectives for IATF 200, which would be around 2047 or so. The first one, which I actually give the largest chance of being roughly correct, is probably the least exciting in some way. Namely, that we collectively, as the internet, will really be the third or uh, major utility uh, that we have. Namely, water and electricity, hopefully gas won't exist at that point anymore, um, kind of a natural gas type of stuff. That we will be the maintainer of one of the core civilizational infrastructures that most people outside just will not know, just like most of us probably have no idea who standardizes, there must be organizations for that, uh, electricity delivery, waterworks, and all of those type of things. The next possibility, which is not contradictory to that, is that we will see new applications, as Jim was mentioning, uh, that are roughly linear extensions of what we've already seen, autonomous vehicles and things of that nature. The challenge there is to get those uh, new communities to actually find us in that they can indeed know that we are, can contribute to their project, most of them, don't seem to see the need at the moment. Uh, medical community was a good one mentioned. The, the third and fourth one are a bit different. Namely, 30 years is long enough that we might actually see fundamental transformations of key parts of the internet, namely both transmission and interaction. Transmission, kind of the uh, quantum transmission protocol type of thing uh, that might happen. I, and that requires a fundamentally different set of skills than certainly than I have. And is that something we will be able to handle at that point? And then obviously with a kind of brain computer interface type of model where the interaction model that is largely visual and audio, which has dominated so much of our work here, is no longer relevant or as relevant. 
in that. I think those are kind of disruptive forces, less likely, uh, but that might occur. On the other hand, I, we shouldn't be, even in 30 years, project too far of a difference uh, between what we have now and that. It's instructive to look at uh, kind of at legacy networks, like we, uh, what we like to call them, in that, and the probably the high point of a legacy network was the 5 ESS telephone switch, at least in North America for that. It was designed and brought into service in 1982. It still carries the vast majority of voice traffic, mobile voice traffic, in the world, even today. And indeed, as particularly Japan and the US medical community knows, the fax machine still cannot be replaced. So technologies tend to last quite a bit longer than we think they will. So I'm pretty confident that there will still probably both telephone numbers and IPv4 addresses around in 2047. I try to look back to kind of see if I can do a little bit of extrapolation from kind of the early but not quite the IETF-1 days, simply because the transition that happened kind of in the first 20 IETFs was much larger than we can reasonably expect for a relatively mature technology. And these are pages uh, from the still printed versions, they're online as well, uh, a PDF version that were laboriously put together as a report on IETF 25, which was roughly kind of when I got involved, so I, I had a little bit of idea of what was going on. And while clearly the working group titles have changed, although DHC is the one uh, surviving member of that working group family, the basic idea is structures of areas, even kind of the topics, divisions, don't look all that unfamiliar. Kind of a time traveler going back would find themselves relatively comfortable in a IETF 25 environment. And conversely, somebody who time traveled from IETF 25 to 100 probably wouldn't get too lost besides recognizing the cookies. So let's look at, instead of looking at technologies, what drives new development? And fundamentally, for the internet, I believe it is the economics that drive it, besides a little bit, I don't talk about that, the politics and the regulatory side. And the transformation that I think we have observed in the past 100 is when we started, it was very much about hardware limitations arguments about variable length addresses versus fixed addresses, address sizes, memory, um, sizes of command words and FTP so that they would fit into 32 bits. All of these things were largely driven by hardware limitations. That slowly faded. We're having fewer arguments as to whether CPUs can uh, handle text or binary encoding on uh, all of our favorite discussion topics. So, but it has now morphed, and the beta IETF side kind of illustrates that a little bit, I was uh, noticing, is that the topic that's number one listed there is no longer a software-related topic, is really about network automation, and if the SDN were mentioned just a minute ago, which is largely not about the software part, but of optimizing human resources. Also, we've had we like to, I think, pride ourselves justifiably that we introduce novelty and new ideas into the internet. But in reality, like good engineers, requirements are brought to us from the outside. So you could argue in the 1970s, the whole idea of the internet became really relevant because we are moving from a voice-centric telecom environment to trying to connect computers that needed interoperable communication. The 1995 type of one, the mobility issues started to uh, emerge in the 2000s. People outside the North American uh, language realm uh, and uh, British uh, language realm needed the internet, wanted the internet, leading to internationalization. In the 2010s, because of consumer internet, privacy became much more of an issue. And I believe in, in the more immediate foreseeable future, the notions of shared infrastructure and autonomous and kind of self-running networks simply because of cost concerns will become much bigger. 
And then, uh, and I think we saw that already, is we'll increasingly people will look at much higher level abstractions than simply a packet delivery mechanism. This is why I think partially the blockchain and things like that matter beyond just kind of a speculative hype. Another thing to consider is that what we work on, at least traditionally in the lower layers, is, has become a really small part of what carriers actually spend money on. Roughly speaking, uh, only 15% of what you pay for services goes into hardware or capital investment, including the embedded software that in that. 70% of that is actually uh, civil engineering, not electrical and com uh, engineering and computer science. So what we do is roughly 4% of the total, an important 4%, but it is only a small fraction of what carriers worry about. And that's why I think the notion of automation uh, networks will uh, become uh, a much more important topic. So, the other one which we probably don't like is that many carriers have essentially become like airlines. They buy equipment that they did not design. In some cases, they barely understand. They largely are a marketing organization that slap their colors onto uh, services and equipment designed by others. And what matters are price and reliability, not so much novelty and engineering feats. That is a different environment than what we are used to uh, in, in the, the previous kind of IETF 100 uh, type of model. The other one is that the economic base is unfortunately shrinking. Uh, it came up a little bit earlier in a different context. Indirectly, the IETF has benefited tremendously from the shift of voice revenues to data revenues. That has largely funded, so to say, our operation because money was available that traditionally went into 5DSS switches. Now that money was available on routers, Cisco, and others, just to mention a name. I will also, I believe, technically see kind of a discussion going back and forth over those 30 years as to the centralization versus decentralization. I'll actually posit that we'll instead of having an argument as to whether we'll have a centralized uh, internet or a decentralized internet, kind of a pendulum back from the cloud environment back to a peer-to-peer -peer environment that was fashionable a few years ago, I like to think of it as a quantum pendulum. It will always exist in both states at the same time, and the observer determines as to which state you see. So those arguments, I think, are largely unproductive. We also seem to exist in three tribes, namely in the tribe that is used to be called uh, kind of a, uh, enterprise network, nobody uses that term anymore, uh, now probably better called the data center network, the access network, and the backbone network. I suspect most of us are kind of more familiar and spend a lot of time in what we think of the internet backbone than we do about enterprise and data center network. But economically speaking, the backbone part is becoming an increasingly small part of it. It is already a tiny fraction of the other two. In the US, and I believe this is true elsewhere as well, the environment, economic environment is changing. We're seeing a strong consolidation of carriers and to some extent also equipment vendors uh, in that. That has consequences. Uh, we are, in some sense, at least if you extrapolate by 2047, we'll be right back where in the U.S. we started in 1984. There will be one network operator left after all the mergers. From a second driver, namely the policy perspective, we've had a pretty simple network, uh, a simple, pretty simple architecture. Namely, where our divisions, our layering, kind of our working groups and areas actually map quite well to the political realm. And I take the US version just A, because I know it, and B, because it somewhat uh, matches pretty well, is that we actually had organizations that even if they had never heard of layers and working groups and areas, map pretty well to those. Namely, we have kind of a Federal Trade Commission, the law enforcement side, and then at the lower layers, uh, the Federal Communication Commission, uh, for example, in the US and equivalents uh, elsewhere. 
So that model was relatively simple. It was clear who was responsible for what, who could govern what, and who would stay out of certain areas as importantly. And it was, the notion was pretty much a global one. While we all recognized that some countries weren't quite there, that was always seen as a temporary aberration. They'll just get with the program eventually, it's just not quite there yet. But it's a temporary trend of transition, kind of, unfortunately, kind of like the IPv6 transition in terms of duration. Okay. And I believe, and this is the challenge part, we've had it a little bit too easy. It used to be that when you worked on the internet, you pretty much didn't have to explain your value. It wasn't like when you were an automotive engineer and you had to account for sprawl or accidents or pollution. It was, and I'm citing here a kind of a not too dated 2004 type of one, where the internet was simply a tool of empowerment and economic, um, an economic engine, no ifs and buts. Now we are in a much more ambiguous circumstance. I posted the uh, one which is refers to not kind of a classical or layer IETF company, but we are suddenly working on the internet isn't seen as completely just a good thing, stop, uh, easy, we are uh, kind of saving humanity type of thing. All of these things are now much more complicated than they used to be. I'll make one point, running out of time, is economics went through a similar transition. Some of you might have heard about uh, this year's Nobel Prize in economics. There was something called behavioral economics, namely the transition from looking at a mechanical model, largely mathematically driven by simple equations about uh, completely rational human actors that uh, maximize utility to a much more complex and somewhat fallible notion of humans as real human beings with all their foibles and limitations. I suspect in the next 30 years, we'll be largely dealing with that transition where we can no longer ignore uh, the human limitations, and we're obviously seeing that already. We may not like the journey for, uh, in the next 30 years. It will be much more complicated than that. I, well, we have increasing concerns about content. It will not just be China and North Korea anymore that are suddenly worrying about content they don't like and maybe that we don't like. I will have national but not I, regulation and policies that have international impact. Privacy is one of our speech restrictions. And I think this is already starting to happen that people worry more about the ability to restrict communication as opposed to simply enable it. You can see that in apps. You can see it in the transition from the open web to, um, uh, to more closed environments, from phone and email to closed environments, simply because people don't want to deal with the bad stuff out there. So what's our role? We no longer get to claim just the easy and good stuff. We're doing kind of humanities work here. And many of us are no longer kind of a junior level that we can just simply say, this is somebody else's problem that we need to deal with. We collectively know how powerful the stuff is that we develop, the technologies, how much it can be used for not just the good things that we all value, but for also for spreading hate, uh, for enabling repressive societies, uh, for not bringing people together, but driving them apart. So we are also, beyond just IETF members, all of us are citizens. We vote, hopefully. We are shareholders in corporations. We are parents, uh, Casey, uh, we are neighbors, and we are drivers of cars that might get us distracted. Thus, we have to think much more broadly about the human perspective and particularly humans that are not like engineers, that have other values, that have other limitations and other goals than we do. So I would argue that we should at least mentally extend the motto of the IETF, namely not just to make the internet work better in and of itself as an engineering artifact, but make it work better for people. Thank you.
Okay, so it's very fine to, to be here amongst uh, great friends and, um, and colleagues. And so when looking at my homework, uh, we were looking, I was looking sort of way, way in the future. And one of this, uh, are, we're posing questions about where our internet is going and whether or not it will be relevant. So let me frame it up, the conversation, because there's some patterns and there's some uh, thoughts and questions that we need to um, think about. One of the notions is that we are confronted by parallel worlds and um, that which we reside today and that which is developing in front of us. And whilst technology is one, you know, an enabler of the internet, there has um, been sort of, there are patterns that may challenge its very uh, existence. And some of them Im implied a little bit uh, by Henning, which is, you know, controlled by the few. And there is a growing trust deficit, or should we ask ourselves whether or not there is a growing trust deficit? Hence the sort of this new development of what I'll call, or what we have often called the flow of value. So we may be thinking about the enhanced brain, and we have humans as software, and then there is the tension between weapons of mass empowerment and those of mass uh, destruction. With all the human enhancing tools, that are at our home disposal, including personalized home robots, the ability to heal ourselves, we can eventually detect um, that we could be the miscreant actors ourselves. Could we imagine, perhaps, and this is the frame up, stalemate as the risks are so high towards the community-driven mass, let's say, destruction? So some observations, as I said, is that there, are, there is this uh, central attending, and this is a question that we need to ask ourselves. If there is consolidation by organization, is, are we tending to have fewer large organizations? There's, whilst there's also this wonderful appetite of societal experimentation, uh, some of which have been alluded to by, by June, in terms of uh, the internet as an enabler for health, um, the in, in, in internet as an enabler for education, but how does complexity, if at all, enable the inter uh, individual? And so that is another question that we need to ask ourselves. This slide, this is very interesting because it was produced in 2014, but it, it's already happening when we think about uh, the 100 years in that we can ha and now have uh, live, transa uh, live tra uh, translation of languages that people were talking about, uh, aut autonomous cars and so on. And so now we're thinking about other kinds of realities that are starting to develop. The brain as the interface is, is interesting in itself because now we have to look at what are, if we are looking at this dial, now I, want to, I don't want to call it a dialect as so much as a polarity. We no longer want to swipe, you know, we, we no longer swipe devices. I mean, there's one hand, uh, there's that which is good. But uh, what could actually, what could we think about if we're reading someone's thoughts? And um, if there is this co uh, ability to actually think about controlling the brain as an interface to, to the internet, the creepy factor will set in pretty quickly. And that is, well, we will require perhaps a do not share capability controlled by the mind. On the other hand, uh, we are living, we're thinking about, you know, what is this whole notion of, of, of uh, uh, cyber warfare? What is a bot? How do we define a bot? When does a bot become a bot? There are higher levels of control. Um, there's this fric friction between individual and community rights. You know, I attended free, uh, recently an algorithm decision uh, making workshop and human rights. So it goes to government's uh, responses to security itself and its challenges. And do we, f do we actually have a, a, f uh, a threat of future increase, if you will, of regulation, a regulation uh, it, by the, of the internet that may fragment the internet itself along nation state boundaries? And this is a very challenge to the threat that we have to, for multi-stakeholders, and multi-stakeholder is an uh, approach that has been so fundamental by which we, uh, the internet, have uh, assumed policy-making decisions. And what about something that um, we often hear about is sort of the risk to, to human rights. What is the place of privacy in our world? 
Can we or should we be thinking about designing oversight systems? What will be the red lines of and now the future? If you think about what is happening today, we look at facial recognition and profiling uh, capabilities that really risk and are risking eroding this notion of trust that we have. The trust which we define not only by reliability as a definition, but do not harm, do not harm you. And with that, we have also the capability today that along the lines of your own um, you know, threat of profiling is around um, you being pro profiled itself. You can be really put in the bucket of you are desired or you are undesirable. And there may be also this polarity between the haves and the have-nots, and this is from AppliedMagicSauce.com. Henning has actually alluded to general data protection and regulation privacy. These are, this is privacy by design, and if you're not ready, May 25th, 2018 is coming upon us. So this is a very interesting interpretation of privacy because it's very, very strict. And so that is something that we are, uh, you know, that we have to think about this polarity, if you will. And of course, now we see this emergence of a compliance or GDPR compliance as a service. So the consent will be much more dif uh, d difficult when we're talking about the individual and much more stricter, and we see that. And so I'm gonna leave you with this because it's really important when I talk about, when we think about these buckets that are happening in the future, is for the next 100, for the next 30 years or so, let's not lose sight of the individual. Um, let's integrate ethics and governance now and in the future for the sake of our humanity. Thank you. Thank you very much to our panelists. Um, the mic lines are open for discussion if you'd like to ask the panel any questions. So, okay, then I have a couple. Um, so I noticed something, sort of a, a theme in, in all of these talks is um, that these are all sort of externalities, right? So there, there are, are, are um, uh, forces that are kind of being imposed on the internet from above, um, which is not new, but it's, it's um, maybe accelerating a bit um, these days. And I'd like to ask each of the panelists to sort of look at, at sort of one of the externalities or one of these forces um, in a talk from another panelist that they found um, the most uh, sort of interesting or compelling or, or something to watch out for. June, would you like to start? Okay. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. First of all, the uh, you know a lot of uh, new technology coming in, and then and as I mentioned during my speech, and uh, then you know the new industries coming in. And uh, uh, which has never been actually uh, a part of the community, uh, like uh, you know, medical area, hospital area, agriculture area, and uh, you know, the agriculture machine actually is uh, very similar to the automobile uh, industry itself. I mean, machine itself, and then uh, turning out to be a robot. But uh, because of the uh, different type of uh, Industries, therefore, the uh, regulation application and the other things are, are totally different, and they're creating the silos. So, uh, but uh, then you know, probably they gonna use uh, the common in, uh, you know, technology like uh, internet, but uh, then you know, in a different ways. So uh, that kind of a segment uh, is gonna be uh, you know what we are worrying about, and uh, then you know, from the you know the the application and the all the usage is going to be uh, you know very much expanded, but uh, then you know they are not always uh, connected in terms of the uh, technological development, and uh, you know we really want to see the harmonies be between the you know those area, new areas and uh, then the you know, existing internet space. So one thing I found uh, that you said I maybe wanted to emphasize it a little bit is. I heard a little bit of a tension between two modes. We've always had this kind of a notion that uh, we do this bottom up, not just in terms of engineering, but also in terms of kind of multi-stakeholder discussions. And you didn't mention the term, but that's the notion largely of a set of 
equals, at least in theory, who were often driven by NGOs as opposed to governments, uh, and certainly not the ITU model or not the UN model of one country, one vote uh, in that. And I think indirectly what, I, what you uh, referred to that I found um, interesting and maybe worth digging into it a little bit more, that model is under strain. Uh, in that, namely, uh, we, why we still have these organizations and all these internet policy type of internet governance type of things in, in our space, the willingness of countries to participate and actually implement or observe what's happening or even pay attention to is diminished. I don't have to mention countries where that's the case, even countries that are when traditionally more have been more re uh, responsive to that, are no longer that responsive, and that's not just the US, it's a lot of other countries uh, in Europe and to some extent Asia uh, where that's uh, similarly the case. So that to me is one of the challenges where the assumption that the IATF model, largely bottom-up organized and other governance type of models, will continue to be, if not necessarily loved, but at least respected by others, that may or may not be the case, and it may not happen all by itself. So for me, I think the, um, I think June's call out of don't po politicize the internet could have been done several internet meetings ago, probably at the beginning. Um, because uh, we see the dynamics that are happening. And um, although one, uh, one goes by the sort of mantra that we are not political, uh, there's this sweeping dynamics that are suggesting that you cannot avoid it or you are politicized. And I think that politicization as a verb is very, very important, June. And um, to your point, Henning, Yes, multi-stakeholder is actually being very stretched today, but then um, you probably, we probably want to understand what does that mean? If we are not working together because governments are involved, um, is there a threat of over-regulation or fragmentation of the internet in terms of a policy perspective is really the question. Oh, thanks, um, front mic. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, well, thanks a, a lot to all the speakers. My name is Juan Carlos Zuniga. Excellent presentations. And uh, I also want to, to follow, on, follow up on the, what is the message that I'm getting. And starting actually from Melissa, I think this is both a, a reflection and inspiration. Because we can reflect on what has happened up until now. And Alisa pointed out it, it's great what IETF has done. But it's very interesting to, to hear, and, and I, I share the, the views that you guys are giving on what's coming. And that's when I think the, the big shift is going to happen where we are moving from, we've done great technical job, to now we have to be more responsible and ethical, not only doing great, great technical job, but thinking about what exactly this technology can be used for and what are the consequences. So uh, I think that you guys have given a, a, a great view, very different, but very interestingly similar views on let's not be political, let's think about exactly what this technology can be used for in the next 100 years or 100 IETFs, as you want to measure it. But uh, if you wanted to give a message, and, and Monique, you, you mentioned that uh, uh, privacy by design is a good example, security by design, I think those are great things to keep in mind. What else do you think we should, uh, and, and this is a question for all four of you, what, what else do you think we should keep in mind if we want to make sure that this technology works for the best for people? Can I take a stab at that? The ethics, I think, is really, uh, or at least the defining the intentionality of the technology that, it, that you are um, developing is going to be very important. Um, that has a direct um, relationship with governance, if you will. But this notion of ethics is, I think, going to be uh, more important in now and in the future, if that makes sense. Yeah, I'll, I'll just maybe take a slightly different tack. Namely, we've often had a, a notion that we could just engineer ethics into the network privacy, whatever, you, whatever values you have uh, in that. I'm somewhat doubtful about that. 
Uh, namely, I think we've discovered that just about any technology that, in, that we've developed, including and that others kind of in our orbit, web technologies, um, wireless technologies, whatever you want to do, uh, I have yet to find a technology that, despite the best intentions of the engineers, in a sense, and none of them presumably wanted to engineer technologies that could get people killed while driving. Uh, none of them probably wanted to engineer technologies that basically are uh, ever more sophisticated ad delivery uh, mechanisms, primarily, and so on. Uh, but I, it's not obvious to me, certainly, that we could have done collectively anything dramatically different. So what I would actually argue for is that instead of simply saying there is another status code or there is another protocol or another X consideration sections that we can add to the back of the internet draft, is that it is important for us to see our role as professionals, as internet uh, technology professionals, that goes beyond kind of our own closed environment where we're comfortable talking to each other, that all speak roughly the same language, maybe not human language, but the same kind of cultural language in many ways, technical cultural language, is to go out and be part of a broader discussion. And that includes not being shy that we can often and we should be able to anticipate some of the things that could happen and that we can't, by protocol design, can't prevent. Uh, but we can, and by governance, by the political choices we make collectively and by the advocacy, at least be aware that we're not just become shields for technology and just ignore that there are risks involved there. Yeah. Yeah, actually, yeah, I want to add one thing that, uh, you know, the uh, multi-stakeholder uh, and uh, then uh, a lot of application, new application coming in and uh, then uh, there is a requirement for the uh, basic of the internet and uh, then, you know, so the, but, the, you know, it's uh, very difficult uh, for the engineer to, you know, engineering ethics and the engineering privacy and, you know, I, I understand that, uh, you know, that's going to be a, a very difficult, but, uh, uh, it's uh, not uh, engineer, uh, engineers uh, not only being, uh, you know, receptive to the other requirements from the uh, various applications, but uh, also uh, we can be more uh, proactive uh, for the, you know, the, the, what the design of the, you know, those uh, areas, uh, application area, including the privacy and the ethics, uh, you know, um, from the engineering point of view, which is, uh, uh, very important that the new technology coming in and then and understand the new technology and the proactive to uh, you know speak up uh, for the you know what's going to be the usage of the technology is going to be very important thank you so basically we cannot longer claim we didn't know this technology was going to be used for a different purpose and thank you very much for your answers thank you um, hi, Bob Hinden, and thank you for the good talks. So, I mean, we built a pretty amazing thing, you know, in the last hundred IETF meetings. Um, I think it certainly it's gone farther than at least when I started this. Um, and I like to think mostly, you know, it's a good thing, and we've done a good thing for the world. But I, I'm, I admit being more concerned as we see it being used for things which are not good. And, you know, we've certainly built something that allows, gives people who want to do bad things a very easy way to multiply their work a lot. And they can be far away from the thing they're doing it to or the people they're doing it to or trying to get money from, you know, oh, we know all of these things. And I fear this is going to only get worse. And I, I don't, I mean, I want to keep thinking this was a good thing for everyone and, you know, the people who aren't connected yet. And it clearly has been, but there's this sort of dark side that I, you know, I don't know what, I don't know what, you know, we do point solutions around this, but I, I don't know what we should be doing about this because it, it could get a lot worse. So I'd like to hear what you guys think. And I'll take it, I mean, maybe the best. Well, I, I'll take two stabs at it. I mean, one is it definitely 
a set of things where I, I think most everybody except kind of perpetrators believe that this is a bad thing, this is the criminality side of things that you will indirectly, I think, refer to um, the disruptive part, the just the, the plain um, antisocial part, where I think there are good engineering and technical solutions that are not just design solutions, but are also ones where we, I think, can do more in thinking about how we can make those solutions deployable by people who are different than us. And I think the experiences with TLS, experiences with secure email, um, among many other in the security realm in particular, should by now have taught us that simply designing good technology doesn't mean it will get deployed, it will work well, it will be manageable and that. The much harder challenge, and this is where we all indirectly talked about kind of a human a computer brain interface, we tend to think of it as the brain controlling the computer, I worry much more about the reverse direction. I, we already have essentially engineered, well, not we, probably others who are somewhat at higher layers, systems that play to human, you can call them weaknesses, but maybe are just human characteristics I, that are given the tool set that you mentioned that we I don't think I anticipated, certainly, that how powerful that can be. I mean, we see it when we have kids, I mean, how addictive that can be, how displacing that can be. We see it, obviously, at the higher political levels as well. That, to me, is a much harder challenge. Doesn't mean we shouldn't do the first thing, but I admit I'm at a loss a little bit how better protocol engineering can basically make our technology less addictive and less tempting for people who want to do, who want to essentially render the fabric of society. So one comment, one comment, Bob, that I'd like to make here is that uh, yes, it's for good, but there are there is always this tension or polarity between uh, miscreant characters, and that you're never going to get away from that. I think that's one one thing in terms of um, abuse of, of of the internet. Um, however, it's more cognizant, uh, being more cognizant of, of, of that fact. Um, and yes, the stakes are higher, I think. Uh, and that's really uh, an allusion to your question. So I don't have a direct answer for that, but I think it's more being aware. I'll, if I may, just one quick, because I can't think of We have often been, I'll mention just one example uh, in that way. I think we as the citizens type of thing is have often been not as strong an advocate of what we could do. And I'll do two things, namely media and education. Uh, where I think knowing what it can do, the best remedies that I think I've heard for, for those type of more non-criminal kind of the, the divisive parts of it is that we teach students, kids earlier and we provide a healthy uh, media landscape, namely where journalists can do their work, they can get paid for their work, they can add facts to the environment. We've often not been, we've indirectly, not us individually, but by the technology, undermined those things as opposed to um, build foundation for those. And I think that's something we can't, we, it is closer to what we can do. Well, yeah, just a simple, uh, the, the horizontal divide, right? And the, then, you know, the technology area and the, then, you know, uh, society area divided clearly, then, you know, it's not good. Then, then you know, probably some, something to a bridge in the designing the internet-based society. That's what we have to do. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and close the mic line and let the queue drain, because we'd like to get to the open mics. Um, so, please. Hi, Karen Kat. So I had a, a question that sort of alludes to what has been said around building an internet that's better for people. So you all mentioned different examples of what could potentially be done. So ethics, um, perhaps not just focusing on, on devising more considerations at the end of documents. But I was wondering if all of you could speak a little bit more to what that would look like, especially because there seems to be somewhat of a tension between, on the one hand, saying we need to start engaging with these things as they come up more and more, and on the other hand, saying we don't want to politicize the internet. So, yeah, great question. I th you know, again, it's, uh, it's, it's more awareness than, than anything else. I think it's, um, I think the, 
do not politicize the internet is, is something that should have probably occurred some time ago, and I think this is the cognizant of it, is, is, is being aware of that. Now, I know you're working on human rights protocol, and so I allowed you for, for that work. The, um, the only thing that I can say is that it, defining intentionality of use and being more declarative about it, of what it is you develop, is perhaps something I know you do it, but I think uh, even more so stronger today than ever before. Being very, this is the intentionality. This is what this is used for. Anything beyond that point, uh, you know, you're not responsible. Quote. Cool. That makes sense. I'll just, I'll, if I may, subtly disagree. Is I think the notion of saying don't politicize the internet is that's not our choice. I mean, I think the, and in a good sense, it is. Un Politics is nothing but when the origin of the word is after the polis, namely the community that we'd like to emphasize, namely governance, all the terms that we use. So in a good way, the internet should be part of a political discussion. It doesn't mean that it is in itself becomes a tool of that discussion. I think this is the politicization part. So, so, I, so I appreciate very much that subtle Subtle distinction, thank you. Well, then, then I say uh, don't politicize the internet too much. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Um, Olaf Kolkman, Internet Society. I uh, didn't come up to plug the futures report at future.internet.org. Oh, I just did. Um, actually, your question, um, uh, uh, Brian, sort of confused me. Um, I don't know exactly how you phrased it, but you said something like powers from above the internet. From, uh, from outside, from, from external. From outside the internet. And By which, if, you, if you're asking for a clarification, I mean sort of the layers that, you know, sort of under that line that, 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 that June drew that we are um, co more comfortable in. And, yes. And, and, and that's sort of the, the confusion comes from the fact that I think that I've heard the, 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 the panel at least in some aspects, speak about there is not that clear distinction between the internet and society. There is not, the internet is so strongly uh, uh, intermingled with society that that, in, that, that, that that distinction is hard to make. So my question is, comments on that. Uh, on that uh, so, so my comment is the, is the originator of the question is thank you for the correction, Olaf. <laughs> No, I mean, yeah, that's actually a, it's a much better way to, to, to look at it. Uh, so one call out, by the way, congratulations, ISOC, on 25 years. One call out is that report that was written is an excellent report. It really poses a lot of questions if people haven't read it. I mean, I, and I think this is more not that this influence didn't exist. I tried to show that a little bit by example, is that we have not always been good about recognizing that these influences exist. and probably pretended more often than was warranted that we just did this out of our own kind of volition, just like when we pretend often that things are free will that are maybe a little bit more re reactive than we would like to give ourselves, than we'd like to give credit for. And so I think it's more realization that much of what we do, and this is good, I mean, that's what engineers are supposed to do. We're not just kind of, I mean, some debating society that's when doing science fiction here, we're not, uh, we're not doing the singularity here. Uh, so we are respecting and reacting to external demands. We just have to be cognizant of what they are and where they come from and who's driving those, to get to your point. Okay. Uh, Nalini Elkins. I'm, I'm really, really glad that, can you hear? Yeah. yeah. Okay, Nalini Elkins. I'm really glad you've brought up this topic and we're talking about it. This is a conversation that I've had four different times already at this IETF. And um, every single time that I've brought up something that actually Bob Hinden brought up about the dark side of the internet, uh, you know, everybody, a lot of people say to me, don't talk about that, don't bring that up. Um, there's a lot of things, I think, in this context, in, in, at, at the ITF, that we don't talk about. And there appear to be rules about certain things that you talk about, certain things you don't talk about. And, and so I'm really glad we're having this conversation, because I think we need to really think about the unintended consequences 
um, of what we're doing and, and look at it in the context, in the full context of everything and not just one side or the other. And, um, and it does appear to me that uh, you know, it, when you have rules like you can't mention certain things, um, that's very, very dysfunctional. And we have a great deal of power. We have, and we probably understand things in a way that most policy organizations do not understand. And people who are setting policy, for example, encryption policy, they actually don't understand what they're doing, whereas we do. But that's a, a lot of what comes up here is we're not a policy-making organization. We can't talk about that. So, and, and I don't know, and I'm not saying we should. I'm not saying we should. I'm just saying that we do need to talk about uh, the dark side and the possibly unintended consequences of what we're doing. So thank you. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's uh, what I meant by the you know the kind of proactive to the uh, the any areas uh, as much as possible by the some of the people from this community to uh, you know to the other areas and uh, you know the other stakeholders, policy people, uh, you know the government and the other things. I mean, so uh, because uh, as you mentioned, then that they don't understand. Then the, they don't understand is uh, you know they don't understand. Therefore, uh, we are not communicating. Is not the way we should take. So uh, you know the proactive meaning that uh, the the people who understand the internet uh, should communicate with them and uh, then you know then try to convince them, uh, make them understand. You know that's very important activity. Yeah, I mean, I'll just add one thing, which I, mean, I think is one of the values that the IETF has had, namely that we participate as individuals, not as representatives, as organizations, even though when they pay for travel and might make sure that we still have a paycheck next month, all of that. In my sense, and I didn't mention it, that that was relatively in most cases, relatively easy in the past 30 years. They're just, A, the organizations tended to be when plumbing organizations in many cases, if you like, internet plumbing organizations. Uh, the organizations tended to be relatively non-influential in terms of policy, non-influential in terms of just public perceptions, as in most of the organizations we worked for. Nobody had ever heard of outside of a relatively small community, except maybe a carrier that you might work for uh, that was a consumer-facing one. I think that will be harder. Well, many of us now work for organizations, particularly in commercial space, that are dominating in many ways uh, certain areas of the economy or influencing, I mentioned the media, uh, influencing those other areas, often in not so great ways. And uh, the conflict between what we believe as citizens, individuals, as engineers, and, and what our employer believes, or with larger ecosystems of sponsors and others believe that's going to be harder to reconcile and that's just going to be tough. Thank you. So nothing to add, but thank you for the comment. So thanks. I'm sorry I closed the lines a while ago. He oh, he was? Oh, okay. I'm sorry I didn't see you. Okay. Were you there before, Andrew? Who's? Okay. Flip a coin. Um, go. Willem Torop in Elnet Labs. Thank you for this uh, beautiful Gallimaufry of presentations. That was very nice, thank you. Uh, what, what struck me as the thing your presentations had in common is maybe that if you take the end-to-end -end principle it, uh, that with you the end entity is perhaps not so much the phone or the computer but uh, the human being. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to note that. Andrew? Uh, thanks. Uh, my name is Andrew Sullivan. Thank you for this uh, uh, discussion. I, I, I think I want to ask a, a slightly nasty question. A and, and that is, well, one of my favorite 20th century aphorisms is uh, we, we shape our tools and thereafter they shape us. Uh, and, and it seems to me that the discussion so far has concentrated on the distinction between the humans and this technology that they have invented and are deploying. 
Uh, but it seems to me that, you know, we're cyborgs, right? And, and we have become now these, these creatures that are interneted. Uh, and so I wonder whether there is this problem that in fact we've lost the ability really to, uh, to make the kinds of decisions uh, uh, or, or to have the sorts of intentions about what the technology can do that we maybe once upon a time could have had, I don't know. Uh, and so I wonder if, if that's the case, can we really have the program that we've discussed um, here where we think about like the next 100 because the next 100 is gonna shape us instead. So I, I thought I would ask you whether that's a, a problem that we are, we're facing. Thanks. So interesting. Yes, of course, the analogy of cyborgs because you're walking, you know, you're walking technology bits. Um, yeah, I, I think the thing of it is, is when you become the cyborg, is is understanding what you are doing, you know, and its implications. You know, it's it's like people when you have a pack of cigarettes, it could cause cancer or something, and you you understand that. I think understanding the implications are 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 clearly important. Some people believe also that privacy will be lost in all of that. Um, so it's 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 having and and it's. Being able to communicate uh, what that means, you know, when you have that power, when you are that power, what that means to you as an individual. I think it's just being cognizant of it. Okay. Um, the, yeah, two things uh, are obvious in this committee, the developing the internet, developing the technology, and the operating the technology. Uh, but it's, uh, uh, relating to that comment and the questions, I think it's uh, really uh, important for the future that the designing the technologies and uh, you know designing the internet uh, or internet-based society that uh, basically include everything. But it's uh, really um, the important uh, thinking about the design of the future. Uh oh. And I think we have one advantage, and I think this discussion, uh, and we, particularly the microphone contributions, uh, have indicated that. And it's, we are not the first engineering discipline that has had large effects on uh, the environment. Probably you could argue others, namely mechanical engineers, uh, if you blame them, so to say, for the internal combustion engine and, and other machinery, uh, might have presumably at least as large an effect on, on our I mean, human environment. But we, I, mean, I think we've had one advantage, maybe because it happened faster, maybe because it, in some sense, more obvious than just gases in the atmosphere, is that we can see it earlier. Uh, and so that gives us, I think, maybe a little bit of more lead time and a little bit more of an opportunity to react to it. Again, my others, this is not the first engineering discipline which has fundamentally reshaped uh, not how humans live. I mean, none of us can imagine going back before individualized transportation just to take out whatever form it takes. None of us can imagine going back when there was no electricity. None of us can imagine uh, going back to an environment where we didn't have many of the other engineering uh, contributions with their um, imp sometimes not so great impacts as well. Um, so I don't think we're unique, but I think we have, um, I think it's come sud more suddenly and probably um, than others where that's when people have talked about global warming since the late 19th century uh, in one way or another. So I think for us it is a more sudden awakening as opposed to just being necessarily different. Oh, thank you very much. So um, we are actually. I, I would like to have us more have more have had have us had more than five minutes for the open mic. I apologize for letting this run long, but I think this was a really really interesting discussion. I'd like to thank the panelists again. And one of the open mics is up, but I'm not sure what it is because I'm a cyborg now, and my internet is down. And Ted tells me I'm supposed to stay here, so I'll do that. That means it's the IAB open mic unless something has happened in the um, 30 minutes of that talk. So I, I apologize, I Brian. You let it run long, so now you're on the IAOC. <laughs> mm. No, actually, the IAB is up first. So if you're on the IAB, we invite you to join us here on stage. If you're not currently on the IAB and you'd like to be, the <laughs> nominations <laughs> committee would like to talk to you.
So, Martin, would you begin by introducing yourself? You have to press the button to introduce yourself. Oh, Martin Thompson. Mark Nottingham. Jesus. Suzanne Wolf. <laughs> Gabriel well, I'm Montenegro. Pretty sure that's not who you are. <laughs> Jeff Tensura. Alyssa Cooper. Ted Hardy. Brian Trammell, IAOC. <laughs> <laughs> Heather Flanagan, RFC series editor. Joe Hildebrand. Lee Howard. Yari Ark. Eric Nordmark. So the mic lines are open, and we are ready to take your question about the Internet Architecture, the Internet Architecture Board, or the work thereof. All right, hearing none, I'd like to thank Cisco very much for <laughs> sponsoring us tonight and ask the IAOC to join me on stage. And thank you for the absence of questions. All right, if you want to start. I'm John Levine. Lou Berger. Kavar Einschwer. Still Leslie Daigle. Alyssa Cooper. Ted Hardy. Tobias Conroe. Kathy Brown. Kathy Brown. Portia Wins Danley. All right, questions for the IOC, please. Hello, Elliot Lear. Uh, not a question, just a comment. Um, in the department of many fine lunches and dinners, the meeting venue uh, document uh, that talks about a venue selection is uh, just about out of the working group and heading towards uh, last call, uh, ITF-wide last call. Um, so look for that soon in uh, your mailboxes. And uh, my suggestion is that you read it and see if you uh, like the idea of which places we might go for many fine lunches and dinners. And um, uh, comment then. Great. Thank you for the PSA, and uh, thank you to the group for putting that together. Okay. Quick Any? question. Uh, to follow up on your comment about the attendee numbers uh, in that, I wonder if there's been any... Eat, eat the uh, mic. I'm sorry? Eat the mic. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, about the attendee number, I wonder if uh, you collectively have try to analyze as to why that uh, difference between projection and reality exists. Is it something systematic? Is it something uh, temporary when that you expect? Yeah, so that's, that's frankly the analysis that we have to do now um, more. We have been doing some and we have to do more of. Um, for any individual meeting, you can come, come up with a reason for why the numbers might be down, what's the industry doing, um, you know, we had a period of four meetings where no matter where you started in the world, the four meeting stretch was going to be expensive. So um, I think it is indeed a, a combination of having a look at what's going on in the industry, what's, you know, what, what can we see about attendance and whatnot. What I'd be curious about is whether delegation sizes for companies have changed or whether it is just the number of actively participating organizations that have changed. So. Right. Any comments? Um, maybe a quick comment. So, so I have looked at some statistics of delegation sizes and they have shifted in the last one and a half years. And I encourage you to 
look at the statistics. I, I, like I, I only have seen this personally, but not as an IOC uh, body. So we don't actually publish the statistics because we don't do any sort of normalization around affiliation. Like you can sign up under whatever affiliation you want. Um, so uh, we've kind of done it in an ad hoc manner, but it's not something that we publish to the community. Um, but interestingly, if you look at the, if you, if you do some of that and you try to clean up the data a little bit uh, based on your own intuition, um, there's trends in both directions. So some companies sending more people uh, at, at, the, at the end of the spectrum of uh, corporations that, that send lots of people, some of them going up, some of them going down. Uh, I haven't looked at the lower end, I've only looked at the, at the upper end. Andrew? Hi, I'm Andrew Sullivan. Uh, so I guess this is on the same topic as I guess you might have imagined it would be. Um, I, 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 it seems to me that for the last couple of years anyway, um, you know, we've been pointing out that there are a number of trends that, that could push the, uh, this, th this number a little bit lower. And, uh, and we've sort of been setting the stage for the idea that this, this could happen. And I guess the question that I have now is whether there's a plan for a plan to, to deal with it, assuming that it's a long-term thing. I mean, who, who knows whether it is, but just suppose that it were. Is there a plan for a plan for doing that, or is that something that is in development, or is it something that nobody's thought of? I, I don't think the latter thing. Right. That. So I think, uh, as I tried to articulate earlier, in part it's a question of revising the budget to understand, you know, we're expecting fewer people. Um, which has trickle-down impacts in terms of our, now that we have our hotels lined up for years in advance, you know, we are expecting, expecting meetings of certain sizes. Um, beyond that, I think it's a question of understanding, um, yeah, I think it, it, there's work for the ISG to do uh, in terms of understanding how this relates to the work that needs to get done and um, there's further work to do in terms of figuring out, well, do we then just jack up the meeting attendance fee and, you know, make, make the five people who still come pay a lot? Or, um, <laughs> or, or is there a better balance for, um, for funding the work that needs to get done in order to continue to have open standards for the Internet? So, again, it's, it's, that's just saying a lot of words to say there's, there's there, now is the time to start digging into it and... Um, trying to understand how much is us. Is it us? Is it you? You know? And, uh, and how do we cope with that? So maybe, maybe I wasn't pointed enough about this, but you know, there's, there's, there's two sides to the budget, right? And one side, of course, is the, is the income, but the other side is the expenditure. Right. And we, we haven't been very good about controlling that. And in particular, uh, for, for good and proper reasons, we have been extending uh, more and more the efforts in um, in remote participation, which of course is one of the potential uh, contributions here. And I wonder if that's a discussion that the community sort of more generally needs to have, but whether that's something that we're, we're prepared to continue in that direction or whether we need to find some way to recover some of those costs or what all. Thank right, you. so that's, that's part of why I put this slide up. This, was, this is the extra slide in my deck from earlier. Um, so there's costs associated with providing really excellent remote participation, and there's the, the possibility that, you know, maybe everyone's saying, well, heck, I hate airlines anyway, they're just little, you know, tin cans of germs, so why don't I stay home and, you know, deal with it remotely. Uh, certainly there's some of that going on, I mean, I'm sure we all anecdotally have friends who didn't make the trip this time. Um, but it's also a question of it's part of our reality now, and um, being able to have um, such excellent, excellent remote participation means that we can tap into resources that would no longer be available to us if uh, we only had on-site participation, which also I think leads to, I think, what you were getting at, which is do we start charging for remote participation? And, um, and that's a possibility, but I think we don't understand the answer to that question until we have the further work that we talked about earlier, which is what, what is the right financial model for how we float this boat? Anybody else? John? Uh, yeah, yeah, beyond that, my impression is that many of, the, many of the remote participants are from parts of the world where it is unlikely that they would come to a physical meeting, um, which is good, you know, and so we, we, and it also means that if we charge a, meaning, if we charge a meaningful amount 
for remote participation, we're likely to exclude them. Um, and I think that there's, there's a, there's a, you know, there's, there's a related issue that, you know, so the average age of people here is high. And, you know, and, you know, like, yeah, I have this gray beard and, you know, and, and an adult, an adult child, that means I'm sort of a, I'm sort of a median age here. Um, and m many of these remote participants from developing countries are young, which is good, you know, and they're doing interesting work. So I think there, there, there's, a, there's a whole bunch of inter interacting issues, you know, it's like, you know, we need to, we need to do the, you know, we have this work to do, you know, we may well, it may well be the model is that, that, you know, we can't, we, we can't expect to get as much money from part, from the participants as we have in the past. And we need to look at, we, and we need to look, look at other places, you know, and wearing my ISOC hat, this is certainly an issue that I, ISOC is thinking about, and ISOC has always been thinking about development, you know, and ISOC is not exactly poor. So, you know, so that, you know, th this is, I wouldn't say it's a can of worms, but I would certainly, you know, it's, 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 it's a, it's a challenging opportunity, you know, that we all need to think more about because, because our, our future is not necessarily assured, you know, and we need to figure out where the people are going to come from, they're going to, they're going to do the work and what's the model that's going to actually allow them to do it. So I'll observe that some of the squares on the table actually say no data, and that's in part because we actually only started requiring, instead of, we started with um, offering the opportunity to register for remote participation, but we only started requiring registration for remote participation relatively recently. Um, and it's all part of a hand-wringing exercise of, you know, how should we approach this beast, and, you know, do we ask people for their information for remote participation? And as a result, we actually don't have we have intuitions in some sense of who's participating remotely, but we don't yet even have that information. So um, we had thought about possibly attaching a survey to uh, the opportunity to fill in a survey as part of remote registration for this meeting. Um, it, it didn't seem the right time or the right place, but I think that that's one, one way that we may have to look at getting more concrete data about who's using this and why. So, uh, what the, your first question, Andrew, you, you use the phrase dealing with it. And I, I think it's important to recognize there's the budget impact, but then there's also just the impact on the work that is done in the IETF. I think people sort of uh, seem to assume that there's this like ideal number of people who shows up at a particular meeting. And for seven years, it was 1,200, but it wasn't always 1,200, right? I'm sure people remember when it was 2,000, and other people remember when it was 50. Uh, so, you know, it might be that the new normal is a thousand people showing up at a meeting, and then we can, we also have to think not just like, okay, well, we lost $700 a head on those 200 people, but is, are, are, are a thousand people coming here to do work that needs to be done, and are there people who are missing? Maybe, maybe it's the right thousand people. Maybe we are all the anointed ones. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but I think it's important to, to not only focus on this question from a budget perspective, but also from perspective of uh, are we attracting uh, the, the set of people who need to come do the work here, not necessarily the right number of people. All right, so there's a weird dance going over on this mic, and I wasn't sure whether it was Stuart or Aaron next, but, but Aliyah has jumped in front. So I'm going to assume that Aliyah is, has, has something topical on this point, and then I'll go to Aaron. So Aliyah. Sure. So I mean, this, this trend is concerning, and I really strongly agree with Alyssa that the strength of the IETF is in our intellectual capital, is in the multi-stakeholder perspective that we have across the network. And the concern on reducing the diversity and uh, participation and ability of folks to actively participate remotely um, in, will hurt us. I mean, that's, that's really my concern. The other part is, you know, there's a reason I'm working on IETF outreach instead of fun routing algorithms. And it's not because I don't prefer the fun routing algorithms. It's because we need to work on pulling in from the right industries, from our colleagues in the area, not just those who come here, but participating uh, locally on the mailing list. I mean, we've got much higher mailing list attendance, um, but we need to be working on this because, yeah, I mean, look around the room. There's a lot of gray hairs, and we keep having people retire, and that's not going to change. So please think about this a lot. 
Sorry, it's not a question to the IOC, but. Sure. Okay, Aaron. Aaron Falk. Um, so uh, I was fairly apprehensive about making this trip. Um, there was a lot of discussion about it. As we got closer and I was watching the attendees 100 list, I got even more apprehensive. Um, I will admit that I broke several rules on the way here. Chewing gum may or may not have been involved. Um, but I have to say that um, I've been uniformly impressed and pleased by the venue, the AV support, the hotel, the food especially. Um, this is, I think, a great place to have a meeting. Uh, and um, I'd like to thank the IAOC, uh, the Secretariat, Ray, um, and uh, everybody involved for making it happen. I think that as meetings go, just sort of organizationally, um, this has been um, actually one of the better uh, organized meetings. So thank you. Thanks for that. Stuart. So, so you have budgets to plan. And you are? Stuart Bryant, sorry. Yep. Um, you have budgets to plan, but so do we. Um, this time next year, we don't even know which continent we're going to be on, let alone... Not true. Oh, okay. Do we know? Yes. It's posted as Asia. It's where? <laughs> <laughs> it's not on the ITF website. All right, I'll check no, that after. Not. It should be. Sorry? I beg your pardon. Asia's got cheap places and expensive places. <laughs> Indeed, a fair point. So, so, yeah. So, to to respond substantively to your point about we don't know where we haven't published where we're going a year from now. Uh, it's certainly a point of deep concern for us. It's certainly been something that we've been talking. Th that fact that this is late in announcement has been something we've been talking about for quite a while. But um, we do struggle in finding locations that fit us that have the, the right balance of um, our hotel requirements, our meeting venue requirements, and availability, um, and some manner of affordability. Um, and it, it, you know, this is clearly us, and hopefully we're getting a little better at it, but the long and the short of it is, um, we, have been, we had been struggling to find a location for next year's. Uh, we, we believe we have one in hand, but we don't announce before we have the details finalized because that would undermine our ability to close a reasonable set of contracts. So again, I, I can only apologize that it's taking this long. Um, it's not because we're insensitive to the fact that everybody needs to make their plans. Um, it's just that we're working hard at getting better at figuring out how to get ourselves to good locations in Asia and this took longer. Hi, uh, Justin Richard. I just wanted to thank you guys for providing the um, rooms, the explicit rooms for side meetings. Uh, one of the groups that I'm involved in here, we actually had a much more productive side meeting than actual working group meeting. <laughs> like, uh, like 20 <laughs> times more productive, it was kind of amazing. Um, and uh, having the space to be able to sit down around a table and do that kind of thing, um, because we didn't know that we were going to need that extra bit until we got here and the working group meeting didn't quite go as smoothly as we would have liked. Um, but having that space to be able to do that that was a little bit more formal than just piling everybody into you know, the hotel lobby or something like that was incredibly helpful for us. Um, I, I think it, it will probably continue to be helpful for groups like us and others uh, going forward. So I would encourage you guys to keep uh, doing that if that uh, continues to be an option in venues going forward. So thank you for that. Right. Sure. And to be to be fair, um, the IOC can take the uh, credit for having the hotel space for doing it, but you really should be thanking Alyssa and the ISG for thinking of doing it. I'm not seeing anybody else at the mic. Have you wanted to say something? Yeah, very quick announcement. So just so you know, uh, Computer History Museum in California is, has started archiving all of the RFCs. And I'm just announcing it. Uh, the, all, all of the work has done by Heather or from uh, our lovely RFC editor team. I'm just announcing because it, it went through uh, IETF Trust. But uh, from first RFC till the current one, and it will continue being archived from now on. So hopefully. ITF 1000, we will have. <laughs> no, it's, it's proper archival, so it's, it's proper museum grade archival of, of, uh, of this RFC. So your work is being archived. Great. All right.
Thank you very much. So next up is the ISG. Shall we start at your end, Terry? Terry Madison, Int Area. Depot Brungard, Routing. Adam Roach, Art. Another work. Albert Rotana, Routing. No? <laughs> ben Campbell, Art. Kathleen Moriarty, Security. Alia Atlas, Routing. Benoit Kles, Ops. Mia Kulevin, Transport. Alyssa Cooper, General Area. Spencer Dawkins, Transport. Ted Hardy, XFCO IAB. Warren Kamari, Ops. Eric Skrola, Security. Suresh Kushner, Internet. Alexi Melnikov, Application in Real Time. Okay, mics are open. Mr. Black. <laughs> David Black. So we, we had an interesting time in transport on Monday, and I thought I'd come share. Um, <laughs> there's been a couple of attempts in transport over the past few years to do something in anticipation of encrypted protocol headers. These have gone by the interesting names like Sp Spud or Spood, if you like that, or Plus. And to oversimplify, They've gone not much of anywhere because the privacy concerns have been, have been obvious and forefront and they've been dealing with something that isn't broken because none of our transport headers are encrypted now. That's about to change and rather quickly. We have a protocol called Quick coming at us, coming at us that's going to encrypt the transport headers. We right now don't really seem to have a mechanism to work beyond that to deal with middle boxes. And while I understand the classic IETF view of middle boxes is that they're evil, I'll remind folks that people, people don't spend money in middle boxes uh, because they have nothing, nothing better to do. They hire middle boxes to do jobs. And if, we put this, and if we fire those middle boxes, they'll find ways to do those jobs that we're gonna like even less. So just a heads up, this needs some attention fairly quickly, pun intended. Thanks. So and oh, I should also, I'll start. Also, oh, you, should also you want credit to start? Kathleen for, for some of the time she spent in, in the wilderness trying to, trying to anticipate some of this. So I would say we are paying attention to it <laughs> um, <laughs> through many, many efforts, uh, some of which you mentioned. And um, uh, so if, if the point was to raise our attention to it, I, I think is the IESG, uh, I, nobody up here would disagree with me that um, we are paying a lot of close attention to this. Uh, if people have suggestions about uh, what more we could do, that, that would be helpful. But it's certainly been, I would say, a dominant topic of discussion in the IESG lately. Kathleen? Thank you. So I've been thinking about it a little bit more in terms of um, next steps. So we're just at a phase of documenting right now. And um, for the draft that Al and I have been working on getting beaten up with for and whatnot, um, it's in last call right now and it's a collection of 
um, monitoring network um, and security monitoring that's somehow impacted um, by encryption, right? And it's meant to be a starter for conversation. So anyone not aware of, of this draft, um, how can we make progress in, in these discussions? And so it's trying not to take any, any position, um, but if we don't tackle the problems, uh, our protocols won't get deployed is, is one of my concerns, which is why you know, we've been working on this particular draft. Um, this is just documenting the problems is, is just the first step. Um, once we do get a little bit further in the document or get the documentation published, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure there's gaps in this. So if you have um, operational experience and can take a look at the draft, that would be helpful. Or if you have colleagues that you think should take a look at it to make sure we're getting as much documented as we can, that would be helpful. Um, I think, so we have to think of a bit more about what are our next steps. It might be per protocol that we go back and look at this and we expand you know, sections to figure out what um, considerations might be necessary. I would like to figure out if, if we could have a more um, structured plan around it. You know, do we run a workshop, um, you know, have the IAB run a workshop? on next steps, is it around one protocol, is it around multiple protocols? Um, how do we advance this conversation between the end user and the network? Um, and it's not just about privacy. Privacy is what you hear about in the arguments, it's about control, right? So who's controlling the metadata? Is it the endpoints or is it the network? And there's lots of money in that, so I think it adds contention to this discussion. And that's, I think, a, a really important point to consider as, as we're working on this, right, because um, the motivations are, um, if you think of it in that way, are, are, are pretty clear, but um, there's a lot of work to be done because it's such a point of contention and I think we need to figure out how we go forward. So I have in my queue up here, um, Spencer, Warren, Benoit, Aaliyah, and then Ted. <laughs> you, you might want to keep it brief. <laughs> So, um, I'm Spencer Dawkins, uh, the Responsible Area Director for uh, QUIC and Davis Group TSVWG and the sponsor for the SPUD BOF and the sponsor for the Accord BOF and the sponsor for the PLUS BOF. I'm trying to remember if there were any others. Uh, so, this has followed my radar. Um, the thing that I would like to see happening first and quickly is for us to get a good understanding of what is. Um, Kathleen's draft is, is headed that direction. Uh, there's another one on uh, NTSVWG uh, that I've been talking with David about, uh, specifically on encrypted transport headers and basically what the impact of that is and things like that. I think that if we're gonna do engineering We've got to be able to, to, to. We got to be able to describe reality first, so that we know what. So that we know what problems we're going to try to solve. Um, I think that the IETF can do what needs to be done, and I've been telling the people that all week. Um, it's not like nobody's working on it. I've had probably 15 hours of conversations on this specific topic outside working group meetings uh, this week. So um, like I say I would, I would encourage everyone uh, who is touching this space uh, to, uh, to help us move, move forward. Yeah, I'm just going to say if people have read earlier versions of Kathleen's draft, please reread it. It's substantially different both in terms of tone and content. So uh, I fully agree with your analysis, and I would extend that not only to transport, but also to ops, obviously, right? Uh, because uh, there is an impact on ops. Whenever in the pervasive monitoring RFC, we added a small sentence that encryption is good and privacy is good, 
but we have to do a, we need to have a balance with the way to monitor networks and uh, so yes I agree with you I'm really concerned about the future of the internet if only a couple of people could innovate So I'd like to turn the question around from asking the IESG to pay attention because we manage the work that you come up with and bring to us. And this is an area where we need research and we need people thinking. We can document the problems. We can see the technology change needing to happen for other reasons. But this is one of those places where we have an opportunity both to change or tilt the field, as David Clark talked about at a previous plenary, to think about the ethics and the implications of what we're doing here, and more to the point and equally critical, or I shouldn't say more to the point, equally critical to make sure the internet keeps working. So think about what you could do. What kind of research, what kind of problems are you going to see in your enterprise networks? Because we all have them in your customer networks. What kind of changes would it imply for the vendors? Uh, what kind of new technology could we use to do better network management and operations? Obviously, I would like you to think about what impact it will have in routing potentially as a result of those things too. But the key point is we need you to be thinking about it and bringing the work to the IETF to get done and standardized. Thank you. Uh, Ted Hardy, IAB, you rem may remember us from Kobe. We're the thing you associated with it that's not the beef. Um, <clears throat> so the role of the IAB uh, anymore is not to tell the IETF what to do. However, we do try and think about uh, issues like this, and we have been thinking about this one for a very long time. Uh, we ran the Marnu workshop. Uh, we contributed a great number of people to both the effort around SPUD and PLUS, and we continue to work on this. In fact, we suggested yet another workshop on this, uh, and were asked to delay it um, because there was such active uh, contention around the topic in TLS that it would look like uh, the IEB was trying to step in. I think that what we've been trying to articulate through the couple of years we've been working on the problem has <clears throat> essentially boiled down to this, that the messages which carry state mechanics between endpoints and the messages which carry signals to the path have divorced, and we do not intend to marry them again. That means that the messages which carry path signals now need a whole new type of creation and analysis than we've seen in the past. Uh, inside the quick working group, there was a design team looking and analyzing the impact of a single spin bit. This is one bit worth of signal to the path. And over several months, we got a whole bunch of academic information and a whole bunch of practical experience that told us, yeah, from a geolocation threat analysis, this isn't actually a big deal. What it can actually provide the operators <clears throat> isn't actually any data that we can't get any other place else, but it may be more convenient for that than other things. That's the level of analysis that we're gonna have to do bit by bit as we put these things onto the path. Because from now on, we have to realize that we're responsible for these path signals. They're not gonna be accidental inferences of the state mechanics we're sending across the network. They're our responsibility, and I think we have to do it very carefully, but we absolutely have to do the analysis. Uh, Spencer, again, I just wanted to add one more thing. Uh, first, uh, I, would, I would think that uh, at least the IAB semi-workshop was also relevant in this space. So basically, we, we've gotten to the point on this with leadership to where the IAB can't, chair can't remember all the stuff that they're doing trying to help. It was a previous chair that did that one too. <laughs> sure. Um, and um, the, way, the way the IAB and ISG do annual retreats is this past year, uh, the IAB met for two days, we met jointly for a day, and the ISG met for two days. I don't know what the IAB did a lot, but I know that we talked about this on our joint day, and we talked about it on Thursday, and we talked about it on Friday. 
And if we were still there, we would probably still be talking about it. So uh, please understand that you have the interest and backing of your leadership as you are doing these investigations and helping us, to, helping us all to understand uh, what we need to understand in order to move forward. Okay, let's move on, go ahead. Yeah, Thomas Eckert, uh, what work product is planned to document um, what will break moving from TCP to QUIC uh, and can be recovered or cannot be recovered in a uh, language that is understandable by you know operators and not protocol geeks? So we have the manageability statement which is um, only there to explain to the network what the bits mean, how you can use them and what you can use it, do with them. Um, and the, the audience is really not like between us, the audience is the outside, the operators, the people that install the stuff. Um, and I still actually learn how to phrase that and like feedback I got is for example, I don't read RFCs, so it's really hard if we want to doc document this in an RFC, um, but we are on it. So if it's on the level of that a normal operator understands, like which are features of middle boxes, like you know, application aware firewall or TCP acceleration or what have you. Is that the language for which work product is being planned? So we, we explain in very detail how you can use the information that's available. Um, you have probably to do some, some own work to map it to the mechanisms you have right now because in future the mechanisms might, might be different. So is that a yes or a no? The answer is it's not only one document. Yeah, and I mean also, it's not only us who generates these sort of documents, right? There are discussions happening in network operator communities about the specific you know, set of stuff that's changing, so it's not only us who generates this. Okay, Dino. Hi, th this is Dino. I brought up a thread on IESG just a few weeks ago about, um, I guess the best way to uh, phrase it is the ir irrelevancy of the ITF and how to bring users here with real requirements. And the things I've heard in the industry is uh, we're arrogant, we don't listen, people, other people's solutions are broken, we know better, and we just seem to be a one-way uh, filter. And the problem is, is I think these people would come here if they felt welcome. And I don't think they feel uh, welcome, they feel very intimidated. And I can see a lot of reasons why, it's because when they come, they say, they, if they come, they ask for solution X. And we're engineers where we want to know the problem, understand it first before we provide solutions. Um, I always use the SD-WAN market as an example. We've been doing overlays and tunnels for so long in the IETF. And there's a, you know, $50 million worth of VC funding at least in two dozen SD-WAN vendors that are implementing all these proprietary things. Why aren't they coming to the standards group and using this technology that we have? Now, they say they want to do their own intellectual property. Now, I think a lot of vendors can make a lot of money and do a lot of cool stuff by taking our protocols and creating good features and good products and services around it. But they feel like they have the need that they have to build it themselves. It's kind of scary. Why are we being pushed into irrelevancy? I think we need to go to these groups of people and we have to really show them that we're not arrogant, that we're really going to listen to them, and we're going to work together. They do need help, and they, they want to build better solutions. So I don't have a question, but I just want a reaction or any comment from any of you. Sure. Hi, Dino. Hi. So, I mean, we have and continue to try to reach out into operator communities. Um, I know that Warren and Alvaro, for instance, are talking about possibilities at Nanog as well as others. Um, one of the challenges is time frames. One of the challenges is that people come to communities, to, to organizations to do work where they feel comfortable and that they will be listened to. And we have a different culture and different time frames. Um, we also suffer from the fact that, I mean, the IETF is made of volunteers and going to, going out has its own challenges. 
Um, it really takes the part of individuals who decide to be ambassadors between the organizations and to help do that. One of the things, I mean, I, trying to start IETF outreach pieces is, it's a start, right? But it can't just be me, and it can't just be a few places, you know, one or two places. I'm trying to get parts there. One of those pieces is to have smaller groups with more friendly conversations on different technologies where you start building up the professional connections with other folks so that they feel they can come into the IETF and be introduced to the folks who will also be able to help and care and guide and mentor and bring in the necessary work. One of the challenges is also, like in the SD-WAN case, figuring out and seeing early markets and industries where there will be a benefit from having an interoperable standard and where that benefit can be articulated and communicated back. But doing all of those things is not our business as usual for the working groups and we're volunteers and we need to have people volunteering to help. Does that, I mean, I'm happy to brainstorm about it and I have been, but I can't do it all myself, right? We all need to, it, it's how do we pull more people in? How can we have folks be interested? I would love very much to see more operators and to see these types of things coming into the IETF and I gleefully jump at each relatively practical new technology that does come in. Um, it's a hard problem, but we can at least keep making headroad on it. So, so we, know we, we, know that these we know that standards groups are important or people want to build standards because there's you know, the MEC, there's all these consortiums, not really international standards groups that do stuff. So we know that there's a need there. Uh, but one particular user group that's interesting is this ONOG, the Open Network User Group. It started in New York with the financials. And these are guys that first came out and said, we're going to build working groups to figure out problems in the enterprise and how to do things. And they're actually turned into building solutions. And they're really kind of inferior solutions, and they know about it, but they don't want to come here. I, I mean, we want to encourage them to come here and talk, and talk to us. Why don't we just invite these people? All of us can do it. Anybody in the audience could... Uh, and we just create agenda time so they can come and talk. But we have to make them feel welcome. We got to remove this intimidation factor. So we need to, asking them to come, sure, but we need to be listening. Absolutely. And that may be part of that. I mean, we have people at the IETF who go to ONUG and participate there. One of the ways that we, I mean, all of our liaisons, regardless of whether or not we have a formal liaison, work by having overlapping communities. We have that overlap. What we need to do is figure out how to grow it and to do the encouragement. So, so they have agreed to come here, and um, I told them I would help them to get people from here to go there. And we're gonna get agenda slots at the next meeting. So. If anybody wants to talk, there's just some rough areas they want us to focus on. Security, routing, um, some application level stuff. So um, we should do this. So anybody interested, contact Nick Lippis or myself. I'm sure we can find some folks who are interested. Yes, I mean, a couple of years ago, Chris Grunderman from ISOC did a whole bunch of sort of surveys of the industry, operators, et cetera. Found a bunch of really useful info um, as you said, we often come off as arrogant. Some of that is people who are well known in the operator community sort of arrive here and we don't know who they are. And so there's sort of a disconnect on us not listening. Um, we did have a bunch of momentum at the time. Like we had a couple of tables at some operator groups to get feedback, et cetera. We lost that momentum. Um, you know, some of that is my fault. Some of that is just we ran out of steam. We were planning on doing it again. Elvaro, myself, um, Ignis presented to some of the Russian speaking nogs, et cetera. So we're planning on doing it again. The big issue is we need to actually listen to people like operators or other communities when they come along and speak, and they're sometimes a bit intimidated by our style. Yeah, um, we have to define what operators are as well. I think in this context that I'm speaking of, it's IT guys that run enterprise networks. Did you want to yeah, uh, I want to just say say two things uh, real quickly. One one is that uh, 
as long as I've been coming to the IETF, we've been talking about trying to figure out how to get um, input from operators, and that's a that's a that's a good and beautiful thing uh, for us to be thinking about. You mentioning the enterprise network guys. That's something that we have really not spent a huge amount of time on because I don't know how the heck you find them. Um, and we were talking in the IEB Stack Evolution Program meeting this morning about that. So again, this is not, you know, thank you for saying it out loud. Uh, it is something that uh, some people here are aware of and thinking about and we welcome help. Um, the next time somebody tells you that people at the IETF are arrogant, tell them that the last plenary you were at, one of the members of leadership was wearing a t-shirt that said, I smile because I have no idea what's going on. So just, just two quick things based on a couple things you said, Dino. Um, one is, please don't wait until the next meeting. Like we, do, we can do the work on the mailing list and that actually helps a lot, I think, to kind of prepare in advance um, before you, you know, try to get people up on the front of a stage. Um, so the, the work in the background, I think, is extremely important. But the other thing is that, um, and maybe this is like a little bit of a contrast from what some people have said here, the, the ITF is a two-way street, right? What the, it's an extremely open organization I cannot prevent anybody else from coming and, and criticizing your thing if you're going to bring it here. And, part, and there's an education piece to that that's different from you going off into a consortium with two of your friends and, and building a protocol that suits the three of you. Uh, that's, that's just not what we do here. And so I think um, if, to the extent that people are used to operating in that kind of environment, it does take a while to realize that it's not the same here. Uh, but, you know, it's it's extremely difficult to uh, prevent people from, from being critical of other people's work in the IETF, right? Like, yeah, that's well, just I think some table wanna, stakes. want to use the protocols here, but you know what I'm going to say next is it just takes too long to get things done. So well, that's a yeah, different issue, but yeah. 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 All right, Adrian. Oh, I was just, I mean, we can do things on tone setting. You know, I know as, as an area director, I've pulled people aside and, and, you know, helped to try to correct any tone problems, but if something is getting, um, you know, personal as opposed to technology focused, which is I think what Alyssa was hitting on, not not these other pieces, then, you know, we and working group chairs need to be addressing that and keep the tone appropriate. Adrian, I have a new topic. I'm willing to yield if people at the mics are continuing this topic. In the back. Hi, I'm uh, Paul Barrett from NetScout. Uh, just on the ONUG point, I just wanted to say I'm one of the ONUG vendor co-chairs for the monitoring and analytics group. Um, I'm here all week, as they say, so if anybody wants to track me down and talk about what we're doing in ONUG around monitoring and analytics, uh, we're particularly looking at the challenges of cloud and multi-cloud, very happy to sit down with you. By the way, I'm also a network enterprise guy, so uh, you know, happy to talk about that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Andrew, are you following up on this topic? Okay, go ahead. Andrew McGregor. I do actually have a suggestion as to how to find the enterprise guys. Me, yeah, yeah. Sorry. I do have a suggestion as to how to find the enterprise people. Um, as we've just seen, there are some here, but many of us work for large enterprises. Our workplaces support contacts in our own vendors are the people who know who the enterprise networking people are. Similarly, when those of us who actually work for vendors, like I no longer do, our top support people are who you, who you talk to to find the people you want to talk to there. Follow the people. Thank you. Thank you. Adrian. Adrian Farrell. Um, yeah, I'm aware that I'm between me and my own dinner. Um, thank you guys for your service. Uh, you have an IESG statement on, um, I think it's called on support documents, and these are the informational documents uh, that quite often get produced for requirements or use cases or frameworks. Uh, and that, that statement wisely suggests that working groups consider other forms of publication, uh, including wikis. Um, are you aware that when you make comments, discusses, or abstains 
on s that type of document that has come through working group consensus, often as a working group charter item, has come through IETF consensus. When you, when you put in comments that basically say, uh, I think that this document is entirely pointless and has no value, you are at best being a little bit insulting towards the community that has brought the document forward. Maybe you might like to consider revising your IESG statement to more precisely say what it is you actually think about this type of work, uh, or revising charters to take those items out, or backing off the language that you use in your um, ballot positions. You want to start? Okay. I, I agree with you on... Uh, the fact that whenever a document arrives at the IESG, it's my personal view, it's too late to say that your work is pointless, which was one of the reasons why uh, we created that statement. In, the, in the, the view of new charter creation, so telling people up front, if you're doing new work, maybe you want to think carefully if you want to spend six months doing problem statement requirements, uh, architecture in sequence. Now, whenever they come to the ISG, uh, I believe it's just too late and it's impolite to just say, I, I think your work is irrelevant. So, I, at least for my own ballots, but also I can't remember any of the other members on the ISG, they actually said it's pointless. I think m most often it's like we don't see the archivable value of it, which means we as the maintainers of the stream figure out you know, what do we want to maintain in the stream? We very well see that these documents have served a purpose within the, in the working group to find consensus in the working group, to be clear about what people are talking about in the working group. But does they have value for somebody outside of the working group? That's a question we usually raise. No, this way I'll come back. So yeah, I fully get where you're coming from. Um, I think I should say sometimes we don't word things quite as well as we could. Um, and, you know, if I've ever done that, I apologize. Sometimes we get busy and rushed and there are lots of documents and, you know, we could do a better job of wording things. So the ISG is, is split on our views on these documents. I personally see the value and the archival value in these documents. Um, in some cases, working groups that I work with are interested in their larger community because they have a few people here and a much larger community who consume these and they expect to read those documents. So um, I think this is something that will shift over time depending on the membership of the IESG in terms of the view. And I've seen that over my three and a half years. So I certainly agree that at ballot time is a time to show appreciation for what the authors, the work the authors have put in and the working group has put in and not to uh, disregard that work. I think that part of the reason many of the charters leave those types of documents up to the working group is because sometimes they can be extremely valuable to the wider community in explaining how our technology is intended to be used and setting up the framework that we do a very poor job of saying this is how you can connect piece, different pieces of systems together or the applicability of particular protocols. And so sometimes they are incredibly valuable. And sadly, sometimes they're a document that's been sitting there for five years and uh, has some outdated stuff and is being rushed through. Um, so giving the working group a choice on how to handle it and so on, and then respecting what the working group and the community, uh, the IETF community has thought about the documents is, is important. And I think that's why the statement is balanced. And I certainly would be sad to see that balance shifted. And um, I actually don't recall either that we actually was so strong on what we, uh, what we commented. But actually that message that we put out, it wasn't about um, informational documents. It was that informational documents are, are 
often delay that any solution work's being done, right? That, they, that when people just spin and spin and spin these requirements and use cases, and there's no solution work, you can wonder then the interest to do solution work, and also it just puts a huge delay that we do have solutions. So that, that was the message that we were trying to get across, that let's not delay solution work to be doing 100 page use cases or requirements. And the only time actually I recall that we commented on something negatively on this was that that uh, document came through after already solution work had been published and the use cases that were being there, our requirements were outdated even towards what the solutions that already had been published as R RFCs. So, yeah. so the, the main message is don't be hung up for years trying to do use cases and requirements. I think there, there maybe have been some other instances. Um, yeah, from my working groups. Yeah. Yes, where there was not um, solution work published first, and, and the group felt strongly on it, um, and it hit the working groups real hard. So I, I supported what the working groups had done. Yeah, so um, just to build on those last three things that were said, I think the IESG statement reflect, reflects the consensus of the IESG, but I think uh, taking it further, there's a diversity of opinions on the IESG, which is why you get some ballots that, um, that come down harder and some ballots that are uh, you know more open to those kinds of documents and that's why we haven't we, we haven't revised the statement because what we what we have captured the consensus and we couldn't really take it any further I think we're done yeah oh sorry yeah and I guess I just wanted to kind of say again, <clears throat> you know sometimes you've read a couple of hundred pages of documents and when you're balloting it's fairly easy to sort of forget that there's been a huge chunk of work put into this and when you write your comment, you know, you're doing it in a rush, and sometimes we word things less diplomatically than we could. All right. Hi, I'm Steve Fenter. I do uh, sniffer analysis in a large enterprise network. And part of our analysis of application and network problems is looking at all the fields of the TCP header. We look at sequence numbers, ACK numbers, option fields, window sizes. We typically move sniffers around to different locations and see what the transport header looks like at, at different locations. We need to see what those headers look like when packets come in at the internet so we can know if it's our problem or the carrier's problem. And we can't do this kind of analysis on a load balancer that might terminate a, a protocol with an encrypted header because load balancers don't have the robustness to run a full packet capture. So I can't picture doing this kind of work with a layer four header that's encrypted, it seems like we would just have problems that we can't solve. Okay, we'll take that <laughs> as a comment, I guess. Uh, I mean, obviously this is part of the larger conversation that we were having earlier um, that, that David Black raised. Yes. Uh, sorry, I'm vertically challenged. Um, I would agree with the two comments that were made. Um, you know, being relatively new to um, IETF, um, three of them so far, but I've been in standards work for a very long time. I am a, Can you give you know, us your name? Uh, Brett Jordan. Thank you. Um, I've been involved in standards work for a long time. I am an enterprise, you know, large-scale network uh, engineer, uh, very large scale. And so um, I do feel the pain that people have when they come and they bring up ideas or they bring up concerns and they're shot down. I have pretty thick skin, so I'm willing to fight, but I know a lot of people aren't. And so there is a consensus view that the IETF doesn't care about what the enterprise needs or the telco space needs, and that's something we need to fix. Um, so you need to listen, and you need to not be shot down, and you ask us to come and give us our use cases and the things that we have problems with, you need to pay attention. You know, we're not, you know, we spend thousands of dollars to come here to say, you know what, these things are going to break. Now, quick, I'm really excited about, but I'm also completely terrified with. Um, for the points that were just made, you're basically going to say that the endpoint user, the end user, or the application support person are the only two people that can help you. And we know that the application developers don't have a clue how the network works. 
So you're basically saying that all of the network engineers that are called on on a regular basis to say, hey, this application is running slow, this application is sluggish, it's broken, something's wrong, help. And so we need to make sure that you know, when I come or when other people come that are enterprise you know, managers and, and have lots of experience doing this, um, you know, I'm not just here to complain, I'm here to make this better. So thanks, thanks for all you do. Thank you for coming. So I, I wanted to say thank you very much for coming and for your comment. And I think one thing that's been sort of a, <clears throat> a, a disconnect here is the scale of change that happened when uh, we decided to recommend that the, that the network be by default encrypted. Because as you know, for a long time, there were always encrypted flows on the network. And we'd been recommending for a generation that encryption be available what changed really was we recommended that it be the default. And the best parallel I think I've heard this week was somebody saying, it's like having a wireline network and somebody turning on 802.11. Suddenly the stuff is going through the air, you can't see it at all, anything you put on your network to see what's happening can't be measured and can't be seen. And with Casey who was here before, as our example, you realize we really do care about that, but what we haven't gotten across to you or to other enterprises is that this change is, is real, that the, the shift from uh, default unencrypted to default encrypted is the same kind of sea change we had in our networks when we went from wireline networks to a mix of wireline and wired ne uh, wireless networks. And that we're gonna have to do the same things as an industry that we did then, which is develop new techniques for looking at um, how things traverse the network in these new ways. Um, and if there's some way in which that seems like we haven't been listening to you, I, I truly apologize. But if there's some other way that we can try and indicate the scale of change we're trying to foster here, I'd, I'd love to talk to you and find out how better to express that. And, whoa, that got loud. Um, and as a responsible AD for Kathleen and Elle's MMWG or MM uh, Effect Encrypt document, um, I'll quickly use this as a sales pitch. Um, please read the document. It really discusses sort of the things that are going to change in a world of pervasive encryption um, and things that operators should be aware of. It doesn't say that we shouldn't be doing encryption. It just tries to make people aware, you know, both on the operator and protocol designer side so that we can make sure that you know encryption will actually be deployed and it won't be blocked, um, which might otherwise happen. I have no issue with encryption and privacy. I, I'm a big proponent of that. My concern is when your application breaks and you can no longer talk to your, you know, SPSS, you know, or Oracle server, and you can't do your expense report and you need to call the network team to say, hey, can you troubleshoot this and figure out why? We're gonna say, sorry, can't help you. Violent just, agreement. Uh, just and, and I just wanted to say, I used to, I used to do the network monitoring thing, looking at clear text payloads uh, for a living for at least a couple of years. So I'm, I, I know what that looks like. I know what, the, you know, I know what that looks like, I understand. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. So I guess the other piece I would say is we are listening, and one of the things that as ADs we do is help with the conversations and the introductions and adding sometimes that little bit of, no, really, this person is here and you need to pay attention to the kind of problems that they're talking about and the use cases. And I'm very happy to see large enterprise and enterprise operators coming and trying to participate. It's really necessary and we do I mean, in routing, we tend to focus a lot on the large service providers because they're the ones who have been here. And i really just delighted to see you both, and thank you for coming. Okay. Nalini. Um, I, Nalini Elkins. I, you know, I, I wanted to, we have things to work out 
in TLS. I, I mean, of course, yes. And, and I really appreciate a lot of the support people are giving us. But I wanted to, you know, kind of tell you too is that um, two different working groups, V6 Ops and um, the whole routing area have reached out to us and made us feel completely welcome, opened up a forum for us and, you know, meet with us. Like V6 Ops, they, they, you know, they meet with us every two weeks to figure out what we're doing and to go forth and, and help us. So I, I really, and there's so many people in the community that have, um, you know, really tried to help. So I wanted to say that too. It's a two-way street and it's, it's not easy um, you know, it's not easy to do the translation, but, but I didn't want this to be like a one-way thing. Th there's no question that there's been a lot of very unfortunate misunderstandings of everybody's statements and motivations in some working groups, and I'm really sorry that that's happening, and um, we're really trying to fix that. Thank you, thank you guys Thanks. for everybody helping. So Nalini, um, I did try to help on the TLS front and I, I hope that there's some progress. I wrote a blog be between the last meeting and this meeting and I think it, it got pretty wide coverage and got picked up by a couple of other, um, Ripe and AP Nick republished it, but the purpose was to run through your use case and make it crystal clear as to what that use case is. Um, so a broader community could see it. And um, I basically threw spaghetti on the wall with a solution, expecting other people to read it and hopefully come with, with brainstorming ideas on that specific use case. So, you know, so there was outreach and um, there's a side meeting that's happening with um, somewhat related, you know, I don't know what's gonna happen out of this, but um, you know, as an area director, I did try to no, bring I attention to, to that use case. Yeah, 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 no, totally, Kathleen. I know, I really appreciate, yeah, yeah, I know you guys have really tried. It's, it, I think part of it too, I mean, I, you know, I'm, 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 we, we have work to do too on our side is I think that one of the things we've been trying to really make clear is our environment, our use cases, and, and try to do a translation mechanism. And I really appreciate the effort you've done. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I am gonna say though that, I mean, well, I, I don't need to tell you guys, you know, I, I hate to see things, huh, you know, so I hate to see, so there's just a lot of misunderstandings and I feel bad for everybody on both sides. And, I, and so that's, that's all I have to say. Yeah. Thanks. Steve. Yeah, to me the uh, encryption issue is like protecting financial data. We all want our financial data protected and yet when we go to the loan officer to apply for a mortgage, we give them all our financial data because they can't do their job without it. And I, I think the encryption question is the same kind of thing. There are people like me that have to see the layer four headers that have to see the packet payload in order to do our job of fixing problems. And if we don't get that visibility, we're not gonna be able to do our job. There are problems that will not be solved by logging. There are problems that will not be solved by endpoint analysis only, or they're gonna take an unacceptably long time to solve if that's the only visibility we have. I don't think this is blowing up yet, yet because these protocols are not in all the enterprise data centers yet. We have already seen perfect forward secrecy in our data center, and we've had problems that we couldn't solve in a timely manner. Uh, this is Dino. Maybe I um, could help with some experience I had doing this crypto. Um, I went to the security guys helped me quite a bit, or helped Brian and I quite a bit to do this, and it was great. But it was kind of funny, there was this di dichotomy. Um, they said, oh, you don't need to do uh, encryption over tunnels because the end systems are going to do it to end to end. We're going to have this wonderful world. And then um, other people said, oh, no, we need to look at the packet. So there needs to be clear text at some point along the way, right? So you should, you should do it, right? So some people said, well, make the tunnel go all the way at the end points, and then you have your end to end security. And then when you need the visibility, you bring the tunnels like this, and you have clear text on this side. So you could just move this thing and have this sort of flexibility. And um, I mean, people, it sounds pretty flexible, but then people say no, or well, it's pretty weak on the links. Well, he needs the weakness where he needs it, and he needs the strength where he needs it, so. So, I mean, this being IETF 100, I, I think it's 
it's probably interesting to think for a second, if you go all the way back in the history, like what did people think that they needed and not, and, or that they didn't need, right? And how much has that probably changed over time? I think that's one of the interesting things about when you come to the IETF is that um, how much that perception can change. And I think there's probably gonna be some of that that is gonna happen on, on all sides here, right? Like, like the, the things that you believe in that, that you feel so strongly that absolutely it cannot be any other way. It turns out like if you, if you went back 10 years and you look at what those things are, like none of them are true anymore, right? So um, I hope that the, the kind of uh, spirit of collaboration that we're, I think the IHG is trying to foster around this topic, um, you know, leads to some of those kind of uh, paradigm shifting uh, thoughts for everybody. Thanks. Good discussion. Thank you.